Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage a cappella group, Singers. Time flies, make a stay. 
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We are singers. Welcome to this music world. The next song will Morton take care of. Get it together. Now's the time for stepping out of place. Get up on your feet and give account of your faith. Pray to God or something, or whatever you do. What does he can make me stop and stare? But who am I to judge the color of your hair? Surely all your feelings much the same as I do. We got to keep this world together. Gotta keep it moving straight Love like we meet forever So the people can relate So the people can relate If you're rolling to your left Don't forget I'm on your right Just to forgive each other a little love and we just might Some love and we just might We gotta do something We gotta do something We gotta do something ba, ba. Thinking of the troubles of today Is it easier to put that gun away? Or is it difficult to stop the world and show them you can? Oh, 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 oh. Everything and everyone we know is beautiful. You're the guy that Surely like to you save will be us the God and light to save us all. Maybe we can be the vision of a prophet mainstream. We got to keep this world together. Hey. I gotta keep it moving straight Love like we mean forever So the people can relate So that people can relate If you're rolling to your left Oh, don't forget I'm alright Just to forgive each other a little love and we just might A little love and we just might Come on We have something Do you have something? Cause we have something for you We have something for you We have something Do you have something? Cause we have something for you Let's jazz it up We got to keep this world together. Keep this world together. I got to keep it moving straight. Yeah, love like we need forever. Like we need forever. So the people can relate. Now, if you roll into your land, don't forget I'm on the right. Trust and forgive each other. And love each other. A little love and we just might. Some love and we just might. Thank you so much.
much. Thank you. Hope you are waking up now. We are now singing our last song. And since we are very few up here, only five persons, and you are a lot of persons down there, we would really like you to join the choir. Maybe not come up here, just stay down there. But uh, we are going to sing a wonderful Michael Jackson song, Heal the World. And I'm sure that you all know this song. So please join us for the chorus. Okay? Okay? Thank you. There's a place in your heart And I know that it is love And this place could be much brighter than tomorrow And if you really try I know there's no reason to cry In this place you feel there's no hurt or sorrow There are ways to get there If you care enough for the living Make a little space. Make a better place. Okay, come on. Heal the world. Come on, everybody. Make it a better place for you and for me and the entire human race. There are people dying if you care enough for the living. Make a better place for you. I am sure you know this song, and I am sure you can do it much better. So I want to hear you sing together with us before we continue. You ready? One, two, Everybody. heal the world. Heal the world, make it a better place Are you out there? for you and for me and the entire human race. There are people dying if you care enough for the living. Make a better place for you and for me. Thank you. If you want to know why, there's a love that I cannot lie. Love is strong, it only cares for joyful giving. If we try, we shall see in this bliss we cannot feel. Fear or dread, we stop existing and start living. Is growing, make a better world. Let's make, make a better, better world. world. Come on, heal the world. Everybody, make it a better place for you and for me and the entire human race. There are people dying if you care enough for the living. Make a better place for you and for me. And the dream we were conceived and will reveal in the joyful face. And the world we once believed in will shine again in gray. Then why do we keep strength in life? Who the world has a fight so? Well, it's hard to be this man is heavenly. Be God's girl. Heal the world. You and for me and the entire human race. There are people dying if you care enough for the living. Make a better place for you and for me. You and for me. Let me hear you sing. You and for me. You and for you me. You and me.
Thank you so much, singers. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for now. Let me first congratulate the ITUC on the holding of your fourth Congress. On behalf of all Singaporeans, I would also like to extend my warm greetings to all the delegates present at the Congress as you celebrate 150 years of union progress. Your courage and activism in the pursuit of democracy, rights and social justice for working people have made an impact. So you have every reason to celebrate, as unions have done a lot in advancing the interests of working people. Improvements in workers' lives have not occurred by chance. It came about due to the strong advocacy and hard work of union activists all over the world, who believe strongly and passionately in a just and equal world for all people, regardless of their background. Trade unions are still very relevant and needed today to ensure that we have a fairer globalization that will benefit everyone and not just some in a population. Whether we are in the developed or developing world, what workers want is decent work, a safe and healthy workplace to be treated with dignity and respect and to have a strong voice to influence decision making at work and in society. At the same time, unions need to help workers prepare for the tremendous changes that are taking place, particularly in technology, which will impact their jobs and lives. A greater focus on education and skills upgrading is important so that workers too can benefit from economic progress. In Singapore, that is what the unions, employers and government have been doing and we have seen the benefits of this collaboration. I am confident that unions under the leadership of the ITUC will continue to play a significant role in ensuring that workers and their families are treated fairly and equally. Nós vamos dar início à plenária. Fones de ouvido. A mesa fala português. Nós vamos adotar o seguinte procedimento nesta manhã. Nós vamos chamar dez oradores da lista de inscritos. Logo após os dez oradores falarem, nós vamos chamar as duas candidatas à Secretaria-Geral, que terão 15 minutos cada uma para expor o que pretendem fazer nos próximos anos. Depois chamaremos a, a presidente da Comissão de Verificação de Poderes, que explicará ao plenário, aos delegados deste Congresso, os procedimentos a serem adotados para o processo eleitoral. Então, repetindo, primeiro dez oradores, depois chamaremos a Sharon e a Susana, para que tenham 15 minutos cada uma para expor ao plenário as suas ideias, o que pretende fazer nos próximos anos, e depois a presidente da Comissão 
de verificação de poderes. Logo após a exposição da presidente, faremos o processo eleitoral. Ok? E depois, à tarde, nós iremos à Suécia e o Peter, depois, vai explicar como é que vai ser a atividade na Suécia. Então, na lista de inscritos, nós cham estamos chamando Carmelo Barbalho, que é da UIL da Itália. Ah, o, P o Peter que vai explicar primeiro a atividade da Suécia. Ok. Dear friends, colleagues, comrades, um, uh, this uh, ITUC Congress is uh, really the first Congress ever that will be held in two countries. So, um, as you know, we have invited you this uh, afternoon to uh, a trip to the very close country, Sweden, and uh, its third biggest city, Malmö. But there is something you have to know before leaving, and uh, somebody asked me yesterday night, is the trip to Malmö six hours? Because you could see that if you look in the program. No, Malmö is about uh, 20 minutes away, so it's not that far. So bus ride will take uh, 20 minutes, but then we will do a range of programs in Malmö, and the interesting uh, thing with the journey is that Malmö was a really, really affected city from industrial moves some 30, 20, 30 years ago. And then for 20, 30 years, we worked very hard to make Malmö a very modern city. It's one of Europe's most multi-ethnic city. It's uh, people from 174 countries living in Malmö. And we try to work uh, to integrate every people in daily life and uh, organize a workplace for everybody. But, as you know, we had had big difficulties in, uh, in the European countries. So many, many uh, countries, they must show nowadays passports when going through two countries. We organize, so it should be really, really swift and really effective. But you must bring your passport. You must bring your passport to this journey to Malmö. The first bus are leaving at one o'clock. So you have lunch and then you go by bus and the buses are divided into language groups. So look for your language, a language you can understand and jump on that bus. And uh, we will then celebrate everything we can in Malmö and I can, uh, a little bit of secret, we, we also have an Italian tradition in, in Sweden. We are celebrating Lucia. So this night you will see a Lucia uh, celebration Swedish way. So special for our Italian friends. But one o'clock, bring a passport and enjoy the global contact with Sweden this afternoon and night. Thank you very much. Vamos então iniciar pela lista de oradores inscritos. O primeiro companheiro Carmelo Barbalho, que é da UIU da Itália. Quatro minutos. Ciao, buongiorno a tutte e a tutti. In portoghese il mio cognome non va bene. Sono Carmelo Barbagallo, italiano, e sono con Susanna. Lo sa pure Sharon. E allora, noi ci battiamo per la democrazia in tutti i paesi, ma dobbiamo stare attenti a praticarla anche noi. In questi giorni non c'è stata la pari opportunità per tutte e due le componenti che devono confrontarsi. Noi sentiremo Susanna fra poco. Invece la Sharon ci ha spiegato in tutti i modi quello che abbiamo fatto, quello che stiamo facendo, quello che faremo. Ed è potuta intervenire su tutto. Significa che dobbiamo cambiare le regole. Quando ci sono due candidati bisogna dare le pari opportunità a tutte e due. Se no, non pratichiamo la democrazia che chiediamo ai governi e ai paesi dove oggi è in pericolo. Ormai siamo un sindacato adulto, non possiamo più raccontarci le favole. Non possiamo raccontarci la favola che siamo il sindacato che ha più capacità di 
Creare le condizioni per il pacifismo nel nostro pianeta. Se le, se le guerre sono aumentate vuol dire che non siamo riusciti a fare quello che dovevamo fare in tutti i paesi. Non ci raccontiamo la favola che siamo più forti e più bravi perché abbiamo saputo regolare la globalizzazione e abbiamo saputo regolare le multinazionali che scorazzano per tutto il pianeta e fanno quello che vogliono. Non ci possiamo raccontare la favola che i lavoratori stanno meglio di prima perché sono diminuiti i diritti, i salari e le capacità di rispondere alla contrattazione che dobbiamo fare dappertutto. Abbiamo fatto crescere le diseguaglianze, sono aumentati i poveri, la ricchezza è sempre più concentrata. Un sindacato come il nostro deve fare la battaglia per cambiare queste cose. Molto spesso sono gli altri che ci dicono che non abbiamo saputo fare una battaglia per i salari. E quando ce lo dicono, ce lo dicono con il cuore, perché il cuore sta a sinistra. Ma quando si tratta di prendere il portafoglio che sta sempre a destra non lo prende nessuno. Dobbiamo fare in modo che ci siano le tutele per il commercio internazionale, per le finanze e i mercati che bisogna regolare. E stiamo attenti perché dopo aver fatto in modo che la globalizzazione sia stata selvaggia non facciamo l'innovazione, la, la nuova diciamo, tecnologia ci porta ad avere le stessi, gli stessi risultati. Ieri mattina c'era un robot, gli ho chiesto se si voleva scrivere al sindacato non mi ha risposto. Noi dobbiamo fare in modo che la tecnologia sia usata per migliorare le condizioni dei popoli, non per migliorare soltanto i profitti dei pochi ricchi che sono nel mondo, altrimenti non riusciremo a risolvere i problemi che abbiamo di fronte. Lavoro dignitoso, salario dignitoso, diritti dignitosi, se non facciamo questo come sindacato ci raccontiamo le favole, siamo adulti, la CSI è un grande sindacato, dobbiamo farlo più grande. Attenzione, altrimenti i braccialetti elettronici di cui ci, ci parlano si trasformeranno in braccialetti legati da una catena digitale che mi ricorda molto gli vecchi schiavi che abbiamo cercato di eliminare e che ancora esistono con i lavori precari che in giro per il mondo. Dobbiamo batterci per fare in modo che i popoli si rivolgano diciamo, rispetto al fatto che il progresso deve consentire diritti, tutela e un sindacato forte e noi lo siamo se faremo i cambiamenti che ci servono. Dobbiamo cambiare anche le regole del congresso, dobbiamo cambiare la segreteria generale dobbiamo fare un modo di andare avanti. Buon lavoro a tutti, buona giornata. Obrigado, Carmelo. Agora, o segundo orador é Goran Arius, da Saco, Suécia. Good morning, sisters, brothers, friends. A warm thank you to our Danish friends for hosting this Congress. Thank you very much, and a warm, real warm thank you to Sharon for good cooperation during the last years. And we are looking forward to working with you the coming four years as well. You have our votes. <laughs> Dear friends, democracy and human rights are the fundaments of all global trade unions work. We are a unique movement that have stand united for the common goal of social justice, no matter of color, culture, or language differences. Human living standards are closely linked to human working conditions. The Swedish Prime Minister, Mr. Stefan Löfven, once said, if you want to change human living conditions, start with working conditions. By strengthening trade unions, and working conditions, you will enable to lift people out of poverty and empower them. The most efficient way to do so is through collective bargainings and good social dialogue between employers and employees. This gives the independence and the flexibility that is needed on a global labor market in transition. This is also the very core of the Swedish trade union movement and the heart of Global Deal, 
initiated by our Swedish Prime Minister. There is another very important approach, education. A fair and equal education for all is crucial for the empowerment of people, to lift populations out of poverty and to obtain prosperity in societies. But a large threat is the dismantling of democracies in our time. With the growing populism and fascism, we all have a special responsibility to defend our democracies. We need to show global solidarity and stand together to prevent the dismantling of fundamental working standards, the right to organize unions and the right to strike. Among those with an education, there is less likelihood to fall into the pit hole of misinformation and fake news. Through education, we can empower people, give them the potential to understand the time we're living in, and give the potential to fight back. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Terceiro orador, o Stefan Corzel, da DGB, Alemanha. Ja, guten Morgen, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Ich möchte noch einmal was zu dem Kongressdokument Erste Säule Frieden, Demokratie und Rechte hier sagen. Ich hatte mich dazu schon am Montag gemeldet, weil ich der Meinung bin, dass das Verfahren, wie wir hier mit Änderungsanträgen umgehen, nicht richtig ist. Es kann nicht sein, dass wir als Deutscher Gewerkschaftsbund in der Frage zum Nahen Osten einen Änderungsantrag gestellt haben und anschließend Sharon hier erklärt, dass sich dieser Änderungsantrag erledigt hat. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, nicht nur mit diesen, sondern mit allen Änderungsanträgen, so kann damit nicht umgegangen werden. Da muss an der entsprechenden Stelle auch diskutiert werden, welche Formulierungen wir am Ende hier auch verabschieden wollen. Und liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, für uns als Gewerkschaften muss Solidarität der wichtigste Baustein der Gewerkschaftsarbeit sein, nicht Spaltung und nicht übereinander herfallen und auch keine Boykottaufrufe, das möchte ich hier ganz deutlich sagen. Und wir als Gewerkschaften, wir als Gewerkschaften, wir müssen handlungsfähig sein, weil wir wissen, was die Arbeitnehmerinnen und Arbeitnehmer in den einzelnen Ländern beschäftigt und was sie brauchen. Und ich glaube, wir müssen auch an vielen Stellen vermittelnd wirken, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Das ist unsere Stärke als gewerkschaftliche Organisation. Und lasst mich eins sagen, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, von diesem Kongress kann doch nicht die Botschaft ausgehen, dass wir uns am Ende darüber gestritten haben, wie Histra Trutt und PGFTU miteinander umgehen. Für mich verläuft die, das Problem in der Arbeitswelt immer noch zwischen Kapital und Arbeit und es darf nicht verlaufen zwischen zwei Gewerkschaften, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Das muss doch unsere Botschaft hier von diesem Kongress sein. Und wir als DGB engagieren uns schon lange in der Arbeit im Nahen Osten und wir machen auch gemeinsame Projekte mit der Histratrut und mit der PGFTU. Und wir dürfen doch nicht durch einen Antrag möglicherweise solche Projekte, solche Pflanzen des Aufeinanderzugehens und es ist die einzige miteinander umgehen im Moment dort in der Region, dürfen wir doch nicht zerstören. Und ich war vor vier Wochen in Israel und war sehr beeindruckt davon, dass ein entlang aller Autobahnen und Einfallsstraßen in den großen Städten die Kampagne der Histratut begegnet für Arbeitssicherheit. Und hier geht es vor allem um die Arbeitssicherheit auf dem Bau, wo auch unsere palästinensischen Kolleginnen und Kollegen arbeiten. Und die Histratut hat dazu eine 
große Kundgebung gemacht vor vier Wochen und droht auch damit, Arbeitsniederlegung zu machen. Wenn die Arbeitnehmerinnen und Arbeitnehmer, vor allem aus den palästinensischen Gebieten, aber auch aus anderen Ländern, nicht geschützt werden auf den Baustellen und sowas, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das müssen wir unterstützen mit einer positiven Botschaft hier und nicht mit Boykott aufrufen. Dazu möchte ich euch auffordern. Herzlichen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit. Glück auf! Obrigado. Obrigado, Stefan. O próximo orador, companheira Yuba, da NLC Nigéria. Companheira Yuba. Brothers and sisters, I bring you fraternal greetings from the working women and men of Nigeria. Comrades, we are in agreement that democracy is not actually working for the benefit and interest of all. From the stories and lamentations we have received from many countries, it is very clear that democracy in many countries is working only for the interest of the few. And therefore, these few are also very powerful. In fact, they control over 80% of the global wealth and they have used this wealth to manipulate democracies in many countries around the world. But it's not about lamentation. It's not only about also the attacks that have happened to many of our comrades. From one country to another, we have had the story from Brazil to Africa. I think it's very clear also that we have responded. In many of these countries, there are success stories that our unions working together, and therefore let me salute our courage, let me salute our tenacity. It's not all about condemnation, it's also about the fact that we have responded to those attacks and we have succeeded in many cases. And therefore going forward is the fact that we must continue to unite, we must continue to represent effectively the interests of the working class across countries and across the globe. And therefore building a strong union, building workers' power entails that the rules must change. And if the rules must change, we must work assiduously to change the rules. And I think that is why the theme of this conference is very apt. In the context of Africa, we can see that democracy has been undermined. There is a lot of conflict in many countries. There is also the issue of undermining workers' interests, particularly in my country, Nigeria. Most of the gains we have made in the past 40 years are now coming under attack, but we have responded effectively. We have responded and the parliament is actually standing with the people. We have actually in our laws getting the fact that strike is a right and strike is a fundamental right of every worker. It's there in our laws. But they have now come out with a tactics to say when you go on strike, then there is the issue of no work, no pay. That have not deterred workers from going on strike. That have not also deterred citizens from supporting workers' interests. And therefore, comrades, I want to once again salute the tenacity of all of us. It's not only about condemnation, it's about the fact also that we have responded to various attacks. We have had the story of India, we have had the story of Colombia, Guatemala, unions responding despite the threat to our lives, despite the threat to our organizing, we have responded. And therefore, going forward, we must continue to unite to make this organization very strong so that with one voice, we can continue to respond to all those attacks on workers' rights. Thank you, and may God continue to bless ITUC. Obrigado, Ayuba. Próximo orador, Andrés Jevi, Adam Sik, da NSZZ Polonia. Andrzej Adamczyk, good morning everyone, but I'm speaking on behalf of Andrzej Adamczyk who didn't yes. succeed to get to the podium during the, the last two days. The motto of this Congress is change the rules. In fact, we need to not only to change the rules, but to change the world. In order to achieve this, me, we must start with ourselves. So let's change the I2C for the sake of international, internal democracy, transparency, respect for affiliates. To give you a good example, what is not perfect in our house? Let's take the debate on report on activities. On Sunday, Sharon, our general secretary, invited us to speak on the report on activities at any point of the agenda. 
now I am responding to this invitation. Of course, this kind of unstructured debate with scattered interventions over five days on any item of the agenda cannot bring a, a consolidated Congress appreciation of the report. Moreover, the vote on the report which will take place on Friday. This means that this vote will take place two days after the elections and after the end of the mandate of current leadership. I'm afraid that this represents a major problem of accountability and democra democratic de deficit. Dear sisters and brothers, this is time to change the rules. This is time to change ITUC. Accountability and internal democracy is one problem, and another one is transparency. The General Secretary told us on Monday, and it is also in the report, that our membership has grown by 30 million. We know from others, other reports that trade union membership is shrinking in most parts of the world and certainly in Europe. The Congress deserves to be in Ford out of 30 million. How many are members of the new affiliates and its organization who left the ITUC but still exist on the paper are counted or not? Uh, so the information about 30 million is far from being precise and transparent. Having said that, let me express our appreciation to the work of Organizing Academy. Unfortunately, in spite of their efforts, we have not been able to organize as many workers as we wished. At the same time, the political significance of international trade union movement and quite often national confederations is decreasing. We are under unprecedented attack from employers side targeting the right to strike. Our movement is threatened by mushrooming populist, antisocial and neoliberal governments declaring that they are best friends of workers but whose objective is to undermine the trade union independence and our political and social capacity. Our answer must be a major, deep and extensive agenda of capacity building. We must be ready for confrontation. In order to prepare our robust response to this challenge, the ITUC must change. It must change at this Congress. Thank you. Obrigado. Agora o próximo orador é Abdu Kader, Abdu Karim Seab, da SGFBTU Barim. كلمتي تحت عنوان نحو ديمقراطية تضمن حقوق الإنسان في الوقت الذي تتراجع فيه حقوق الإنسان في مختلف البلدان تزداد وحشية الأنظمة وجشع أصحاب الأعمال ليتكون تحالف المال والسلطة ضد العمال مستفيدين وموحدين باسم العولمة وبأدوات المنظمات الدولية اليوم لا مبدأ يحترم ولا اتفاقية يلتزم العمل بها ولا كرامة إنسانية تقدر بل المعيار الذي يعتمد هو القوة واللغة التي تفهم من الجميع هي لغة القوة فأصبحت لغة الغاب هي السائدة بين البشر للخروج من هذه الأزمة العالمية لابد من العودة للكرامة الإنسانية والعدالة الاجتماعية واعتماد آلية عمل ديمقراطية لإدارة السلطة والمسؤولية بالإضافة للقضاء على الفساد باللجوء لمبادئ الشفافية والمساواة هناك تجارب عديدة في الماضي يمكن أن تمثل درس وعبرة لكل دول العالم إلا أن خلال السنوات الأخيرة وبالتحديد بداية الألفية حدثت اهتزازات كبيرة تبعها ما سمي بالربيع العربي الذي لا زال العالم العربي يعاني إرهاصاته في تخلي واضح للدول والمنظمات عنه في هذه الفترة الحساسة أحداث 2011 في البحرين عصفت بالبلاد والعباد وحدث تراجع في مختلف نواحي الحياة من أزمة سياسية تعمقت بأزمة اقتصادية واجتماعية وتراكم للدين العام وتصريحات للعمال وتأخر في دفع الأجور الاتفاق الثلاثي عام 2012 بين أطراف الانتاج برعاية من منظمة العمل الدولية يعد مثالا للتنسيق بين الاتحاد الدولي للنقابات وأعضائه 
كما يمثل صورة التكامل بين الاتحاد الدولي للنقابات ومنظمة العمل الدولية برنامج العمل اللائق للبحرين أحد الأمثلة الأخرى للتعاون الدولي من أجل تنمية مستدامة التي يتأمل أن يفعل بعد تجميد العمل به عام 2011 أثبتت التجارب أهمية الالتزام بالاتفاقيات الدولية للعمل وتمسك المنظمات العمالية بالوحدة العمالية وزيادة العضوية للحفاظ على حقوق العمال وعوائلهم اليوم نلحظ تراجع لمؤشرات أهداف الألفية والتنمية المستدامة وزيادة في نسب الفقر والأمية مقابل الحديث عن الاقتصاد الأخضر والاستغلال الأمثل للموارد الطبيعية مما يلزمنا بضرورة مراجعة أداء منظمة العمل الدولية ومستقبلها قبل مناقشة مستقبل العمل فما الجدوى من سن الاتفاقيات والتوصيات إذا لم تحترم وتطبق وما الجدوى من عقد المؤتمرات والندوات إن لم تفتح آفاق من الأمل بمستقبل أفضل خطاب رئيس الاتحاد الدولي للنقابات السيد إنطونيو خلال افتتاح المؤتمر الرابع هنا في كوبنهاجن ركز على التضامن العمالي على مستوى العالم والوحدة ونبد الخلافات والاهتمام أكثر بزيادة العضوية لتقوية موقف التفاوض مع الأطراف الأخرى في حين مدير عام المنظمة العمل الدولية جيرايدر ركز على مبدأ الثلاثية التي تقوم عليها أو تقوم عليه منظمة العمل الدولية وأهمية الطرف العمالي لنجاح المنظمة اليوم لا ينسجم عمل منظمة العمل الدولية القائم على مبدأ الثلاثي إلا مع الدول الديمقراطية سواء من حيث التفاعل أو التأثير أما الدول غير الديمقراطية فعمالها غير مستفيدة من المنظمة لا شكلا ولا مضمونا بل تستغل شعارات المنظمة لتحقيق أجندة حكومات هذه الدول كما اليوم بملف العمال المهاجرة وملف الحريات النقابية فالعمال المهاجرة تستثمر من قبل شركات متعددة الجنسية لزيادة الأرباح بتقليل الأجور وتحويل العمل لسلعة والحريات النقابية تستغل من قبل الحكومات لتفتيت الحركة النقابية وضعافها بل تصل لإنشاء نقابات صفراء الاتحاد العام لنقابات مال البحرين متمسك بحق الشعب الفلسطيني ويدعم خيار النضال العمالي العالمي لتستعيد القدس حريتها وعمال فلسطين مكانتهم ولذلك سننتخب من يدعم فلسطين شكرا obrigado próximo orador a Bárbara Figueiroa Sandoval Cuti Chile Bárbara Cuti Chile Buenos días, desde la Central Unitaria de Trabajadores de Chile, entregarles nuevamente nuestro saludo en este cuarto congreso. Señalar en primer lugar que estamos acá cuando en mi país estamos enfrentando el cierre de empresas, estamos viviendo reestructuraciones en el mundo privado que están significando gran cantidad de despidos. Y mañana, el día jueves, en mi país desarrollarán una movilización los trabajadores del sector público frente a la gran cantidad y la ola de despidos que se están produciendo con el gobierno de derecha. Tenemos altos índices de cesantía, pero sabemos que esta no es una realidad particular de Chile. Sabemos que esta ofensiva neoliberal contra la clase trabajadora no es un problema nacional. Es un problema que estamos enfrentando, al menos en nuestro caso, en toda la región, con el avance de los gobiernos fascistas, con el avance de la derecha, y por lo tanto sabemos en ese sentido la importancia que tiene este Congreso para poder enfrentar ese gran desafío que es detener el avance de estas políticas contra los trabajadores y poder no solo contener, no solo ser un muro de contención frente a este avance, sino que también poder pasar a la ofensiva y poder hacer que la clase trabajadora recobre un lugar protagónico en la lucha para derrotar las desigualdades. Es por eso que frente a una situación compleja que vive Chile, hemos decidido estar acá, porque es aquí, fortaleciendo el internacionalismo, que creemos que podemos contribuir más y mejor a la lucha de nuestros pueblos. Pero este desafío, entendemos, no solo es 
respecto del de fortalecimiento sindical, no solo es respecto de la lucha contra la desigualdad, sino que también es una oportunidad histórica que tiene el sindicalismo mundial de poder robustecerse para enfrentar el desafío de levantar un gran frente antifascista que permita detener los avances del mundo de extrema derecha que se está instalando no solo en la región, no solo en las Américas, sino que también en el mundo. Por lo tanto, apostamos y creemos en un sindicalismo que es sociopolítico, que requiere hacerse cargo de las grandes demandas del mundo del trabajo, pero que también requiere entender que este desafío no lo vamos a conseguir solos. Necesitamos la más amplia unidad social y política con el mundo progresista si queremos detener este avance. Por eso apostamos desde las Américas a, este, a esta gran confluencia en un frente antifascista que permita detener el avance y la ofensiva del modelo neoliberal. Pero también entendemos que esto no solo pasa por declaración de buenas intenciones. Hoy el movimiento sindical debe ir a la disputa de nuevos modelos de desarrollo, alternativas económicas frente a las propuestas que nos entrega el Banco Mundial y las transnacionales. Y ese desafío requiere una fortaleza interna mucho mayor a la que hemos tenido hasta ahora. Como CUT hemos respaldado la postulación de Susana Camuso y respaldamos la postulación de Susana Camuso a la CCI. Pero no entendemos esto como un problema de personas. Este no es un problema de cupos para el mundo sindical. Este es un problema de incidencia. Por lo tanto, no entendemos esto como un problema de peleas entre personas. Son proyectos políticos que se tienen que disputar con mayor ofensiva. Pero estamos siempre, y lo entendemos así, que el debate electoral no puede significar tensiones. Tiene que ser una oportunidad para crecer para hacer autorreforma, para avanzar en más y mejor organización. Y en ese sentido, creemos que hoy, en este Congreso, están dadas todas las condiciones para que podamos salir fortalecidos con una proyección mayor y con un proyecto político común. Unidad como la base fundamental, pero no solo del sindicalismo, sino que de todos los actores que en materia social y política quieran comprometerse contra el fascismo. Muchas gracias. Obrigado, Bárbara. Próximo orador, Matt Nord, da LO Noruega. Thank you, Cher. Uh, comrades, and thank you, uh, Sharon, for your uh, good work. And uh, you have our support from LO Norway. I will use this uh, opportunity to share some of our views on why trade unions, tax and tripartite cooperation are crucial components of a well-functioning welfare state. Norway scores well on many international rankings on areas ranging to, from GDP to uh, quality of life, equality and social welfare and work-life uh, balance, just to mention some. The basis for these successes lies in what we uh, call the Norwegian edition of the Nordic model. A crucial feature of the Norwegian model is social dialogue and tripartite cooperation. Social dialogue is supported by a well-organized labor market, where organized employer organizations negotiate with well-organized and well-prepared unions. Norway is financed by tax incomes. However, in every budget, our current right-wing government has introduced, introduced tax cuts for businesses and people with an above uh, average income. This idea of a trickle-down economy in which lower taxes for the rich will benefit the less privileged is one of the biggest threats to maintaining our welfare state. Today, we have a situation where employees pay tax, while the companies and their organization succeed in their effort to avoid paying taxes. This is undermining any stable and sustainable democracy. When asked who will pay taxes when robots replace some of the workers, the answer is that robots cannot pay taxes, but the company owners can. 
Fortunately, but not incidentally, Norway is amongst the leading country, countries in the Digital Economy and Society Index. The use of digital services in the public sector is almost twice as high as the EU average. Why is this? Because the union has uh, participated. We have an ongoing tripartite agreement with the minister responsible for, for the digitalization and employers association and the trade unions. The agreement commits the three parties both on national and local level, engaging in social di dialogue and active workers participation in shaping the process that will accompany the digital transformation in Norwegian municipalities. When employees are involved in the process, fear of digitalization and potential resistance towards using new te technology tools is reduced. Almost 90% of my union members believe that new technology will help them deliver better public services. 80% <coughs> of them are willing to acquire new skills to enable them to carry out their work in new ways encompassing digital technology. Comrades, our members will live in countries with different economy and political systems. We vary in size, population and natural resources. Still we face many of the same challenges. Precarious work, digitalization, increasing inequality and challenges related to climate change. The degree of these challenges vary. But our answers are similar. We have to build strong trade unions. Through active and strong dialogue, we can find solutions for a better society, whether it comes to tax policy, digitalization, protecting our environment, or basic human rights. Thank you so much, and thank you, Sharon. Obrigado, Amete. Próximo orador, José Maria Álvarez Soares, da UGT Espanha. Buenos días, compañeras, compañeros. Permitirme, en primer lugar, felicitar a los compañeros de las organizaciones sindicales de Dinamarca por este magnífico congreso, por esta fantástica acogida. Mangue, mangue, tac. Compañeros y compañeras, permitirme, en segundo lugar, trasladar toda nuestra solidaridad a los compañeros brasileños y a la vez todo nuestro apoyo para exigir la libertad del presidente Lula de Silva. Pero hoy en este Congreso no solo, no solo tenemos que acordarnos, por supuesto, de Lula de Silva, sino de todos los sindicalistas de todo el mundo que hoy no pueden estar aquí porque han sido asesinados, porque están en prisión, porque están en el exilio, en el exilio porque están perseguidos en, su, en sus países. Para ellos, toda nuestra solidaridad y todo nuestro apoyo. Todos sabemos, compañeros y compañeras, que negociación colectiva y diálogo social no son sinónimos. Sin embargo, cuando analizamos la, la declaración propuesta para el Congreso por la compañera Sharon, vemos, y nos preocupa seriamente, que no aparece de manera nítida, sino marginalmente, la negociación eh, colectiva como elemento central de la propuesta de nuestra organización. La propuesta de resolución omite casi por completo todo lo relacionado con las políticas antisindicales y antisociales del Banco Mundial, del Fondo Monetario Internacional, de la OCDE o del nada democrático Foro de Davos. El, de, el documento que debatimos apenas hace alusión a los ataques a la negociación colectiva de estos organismos internacionales, la debilitación de la descentralización, 
la obstrucción y el debilitamiento de la negociación colectiva suponen políticas que han estado avaladas por estos organismos internacionales y que son los elementos fundamentales de algunos de los gobiernos de algunos países que la siguen a su dictado. Es por ello una mala noticia para la CSI que no aparezca como elemento central la negociación colectiva en las propuestas a este Congreso. La CSI tiene en la negociación colectiva un instrumento fundamental para repartir la riqueza que se está generando en el planeta. En nuestro planeta se genera mucha riqueza. El problema es encontrar los instrumentos, los mecanismos para poder, eh, des, para poder repartirla. Y en ese sentido, la negociación colectiva es un elemento clave. Por eso necesitamos un cambio en la dirección de la CSI. Por eso, desde la Unión General de Trabajadores, desde muchos sindicatos de todos los continentes, apostamos porque Susana Camuso sea la próxima secretaria general de la, Confedera de la Confederación Sindical Internacional. No es una cuestión de personas, es una cuestión de programa. Y compañeros y compañeras, la hora de Sharon ha pasado, esta es la hora de Susana Camus. Obrigado, José María. Próximo orador, Han Busker, da FNV, Holanda. Dear sisters and brothers, dear friends, on behalf of the FNV, the biggest union in the Netherlands, I would like to thank the Danish trade union and Sharon and her team for the organization of this important Congress and for the cooperation over the past years. I want to start... I want to start with underlining the importance of trade union unity. We all understand that united we stand and divided we fall. It is a great responsibility to our members and to all workers all around the globe in times of rising populism and neoliberalism to be strong and to go forward with the right mindset. Our people look to the unions for answers to their day-to-day -day needs and their worries. And we do have the answers for them. We know all workers need decent work and precarious jobs are not the answer. We know the only answer to climate change is a just transition. And we know all workers deserve a pay rise. Dear colleagues, I'm honored to speak to you on behalf of the leadership of the Committee on Workers' Capital as well. The activities of the Committee on Workers' Capital were directed at the most greedy companies and provided dedicated campaign support for organizing efforts. An online portal for campaigns on shareholder activism has been launched. We had a very successful Workers' Capital Conference back-to-back -back with the annual meeting of the UN Organization for Responsible Investment, where we strengthened our cooperation. And I thank the ITUC leadership for their effort and the Secretariat for their support to enable these results. Dear friends, the ITUC has a big ambition and people count on us. We want to change the rules and we demand fair treatment for everybody in this world, regardless of employment status, gender, or sexual orientation. And let us celebrate our successes over the past years and build on them. The support for Han San Gyun, president of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, 
was led very energetically by the ITUC and how great it is to have him here in our midst during this week. The ITUC has become a well-known, highly respected player at international fora for social and economic policies like the IMF, the World Bank, in Davos, and at the Paris Climate Agreement. And next to that, the fight in Qatar against forced labor and for migrant workers' rights is a good example of great trade union work on global, regional, and local level. We fought the government of Qatar and FIFA, and we won. Dear friends, let's keep up the great work. Let us stay united and focused. We are on the right path, but we also must improve our internal procedures and strengthen our cooperation. I hope we will find each other in continuing the fight for a better world of work. Thank you. Obrigado, Han. Agora nós vamos interromper a lista de oradores e passaremos a palavra às nossas duas companheiras que são candidatas à Secretaria-Geral. Por isso eu chamo para que venha aqui à mesa também a nossa companheira Susana, da TGL Itália. Eu sei, eu sei mas estou chamando ela para vir na mesa. Nós vamos, nós, nós vamos conceder agora a, a palavra às duas companheiras durante 15 minutos. Primeiro a Sharon, depois a Susana. A companheira Sharon está com a palavra 15 minutos. Delegates, I am so proud to work with you all. You... You and your members are on the front lines every day as you struggle for peace, democracy and rights in a fractured world. Despite our challenge to organise and build workers' power, we are the largest democratic force on the planet. And there is a deep reservoir, a really deep reservoir of courage in this room. When you battle conflict, dictatorship, fascism, any form of extremism, you risk everything. You risk everything for others, for your people. But when you win, we all win. And every struggle layers the foundation for a more stable and just future. You are incredible people in your own nations and across the world. Thank you. I am a trade union woman. I grew up in a working class family and my great great grandfather was an activist involved in the Shearer's strike of the 1890s that gave birth to my own Australian trade union movement. I've held union roles from the workplace to regional organiser plus state, state and national leadership before leading the Australian unions as the ACTU president. I was proud to lead my own movement with my colleague Greg Combe during the long struggle of the Your Rights at Work campaign that toppled a Conservative government and began the fight back for labour rights in our own country. A fight that is now being continued with my magnificent sisters Sally and Michelle with their Change the Rules campaign against the far right in my country. I am unashamedly an organiser. I am a campaigner and I am a negotiator. But of all my national experiences, I am so proud of the women and the men 
who fought with me to right a great injustice and after over 10 years win the fight for universal paid maternity leave for parental leave. I was privileged to serve as president of the ICF to Asia Pacific, my region, and the symbolism of the jacket I wear today. And then as president of the ICFTU, as led by Guy Ryder, and indeed the unity created with Willie Tyers, Luke Quarterbeck, and many of you, we created the wonderful ITUC, a united force of workers to build, building a new internationalism, and it is a family we love. Since 2010, I've had the privilege of leading you as your General Secretary, and I know just how privileged I am. To work for and with you to fight injustice at every level is both an honour and a great responsibility. As a former organiser, those of you who've taken me to workplaces or facilitated workers' hearings so I could listen to our members and we could take their stories their priorities into the campaigns we have built. Thank you. You see just a f thank you, all of you. You see just a few of those brave trade union men and women faces around the Congress Center. Each one of them and hundreds more have taught me humility, wisdom, tenacity, humor, and the great love of our movement for each other. But tragically, too many of them have not seen dividends from the promise of democracy and their, and, and their children, all of our children, don't see a golden future as they face the global risks and the corporate culture of greed that will, conti that will continue to create the devastation we see today across all fronts if we don't stop them, if we don't stop them. We are right to be angry where a world is three times richer than just over 20 years ago, yet 84% of people tell us that the minimum wage is not enough to live on. And we know that collective bargaining is in decline. It is in our statement everywhere. We have to fight for minimum wages, social protection, collective bargaining and just transitions in the world we face today. We are right to be angry when 70% of people have little or no social protection or access to quality health and quality uh, education, quality public education. That's my roots. Indeed, we are right to be angry when progress for women is stalled and misogyny, harassment and violence is on the rise, just as we are right to be angry about the persistence of discrimination against LGBTIQ+, uh, uh, people, our brothers and sisters, and indeed our Indigenous brothers and sisters. And we are right to be angry about the xenophobia and the racism destroying the social fabric of tolerant and inclusive societies. The right-wing populist campaigns that whip up fear of each other. We stand for refugees and the right for them to work with equal treatment. We stand with migrants who are the backbones of our economies. And we, when we turn on each other, brothers and sisters, we lose big chunks of our own humanity. That cannot happen. We are a family here from all corners of the world, whether you're, whether you're in our countries, other people's countries, or your own. We know that people, people matter. With the team of leaders, I hope you will elect, and you saw a great African leader here this morning, Ayuba, who I hope will be the next president. Then we will be on the... Absolutely. Oh, I know that our team, my team, will be on the front lines with you of all these struggles on the ground, in national level standing beside you when you ask us and at international level advocating your call. I want to particularly ask you today to stand in solidarity with our Turkish brother Osgur who goes to trial today. 
his family's not allowed in, and he'll be tried in the canteen of the, uh, of the courts. Can you believe that? The indignity of our workers on trial for activism, for organising, and they're not even treated with the dignity of a fair trial. That is never acceptable. And too much of it around the world is what our members face. There is really something rotten in the state of the world when we see modern slavery or informal work in our global supply chains, along with the exploitation of the model of formal work that our forebears fought to defend and build for us. When we have uh, insecure short-term contracts, low-paid, often unsafe work, generating the immoral profits of the 1%, our CEOs know that this is the model that sustains those profits, that drives those profits. But they hide behind the obscurity of a hidden work workforce through the absolute exploitation of contractualisation. That's why we must have mandated due diligence in every country and a strong UN treaty on business and human rights. It's why we need a strong partnership with the GUFs. We must extend the fight against the anti-union model of the multinationals that we have begun, that we have begun together. We'll take them on one by one but we also want the rules of the game to change. It's why cross-border social dialogue is so important and the international frameworks our GUF leaders are negotiating. The GUFs are our partners and I'm delighted to see them in our panels, in our debates, as they're central to the strength of the movement. We have a negotiated agreement. I built it when I came in with each of them. Three pathways to growth and our support for each other is the foundation. And I am really encouraged by affiliate support to deepen those partnerships so we are genuinely one movement. And brothers and sisters, you know this, but I'm unashamedly also a feminist. I am horrified that progress for women has stalled. And in 2018, our sisters still suffer sexual harassment, discrimination and violence. And then there is the double burden of care. We can and we must change this. The young women in our ranks don't deserve to have to battle for respect and equal treatment as my generation and those before me have done. We must look to our structures, our own structures, and we must demand of employers that the rules and the behaviour must change. Equality and respect for women is non-negotiable. <laughs> Delegates, no region, no country is immune to the impact of global risks. The economic model, neoliberalism, has failed working people. We have said that time and time again. But this model is imploding. And we could celebrate that, except for the fact that in fact it's actually taking our livelihoods away as well. It's destroying jobs. Indeed, it's generating the economic stagnation that is underlying the very heart and soul of the dignity of work. Business is escaping the rules of our nations and speculative capital is prevailing, the casino economy. And the IFI still defend it. They still defend it. Our multilateral institutions still think this is working and they need more of the same. Well, we say no. We want a global economic model that actually can deal with the instability of the current environment, can guarantee full employment, can actually deal with the opportunities, not the threats of the convergence of uh, climate, the disasters of climate, the potential for de te technology, not technological determinism, and to change the nature of the uh, co-option of too many governments by corporate greed. We want new IFIs. We want to build new global architecture. And our strength, our world vision, our values are more important than ever as the foundations. Can I just say that the four years since Berlin have seen the respect for the ITUC grow, even feared in many places. And that's a good thing because workers' power has a right to be feared 
if things are going wrong. At the global level, we have won global ILO standards on domestic workers, a standard on formalising work, uh, informal work, a forced labour protocol, just transition guidelines and guidelines on fair recruitment and much more. We have put a convention on supply chains on the, on the table. The care economy is also on the agenda. We've broken the back of slavery of the kafala system in Qatar, secured UN commitment to a just transition as a key part of tackling climate change, exposed the corporate greed of MEs like Samsung and the 94% of our people who exist day to day in a hidden workforce. And we have grown the ITUC. You have grown the ITUC by 30 million workers. We've built new architecture and partnerships. We are building a mega sports rights centre so no major sporting event will see the disasters of Brazil or indeed uh, the potential that would have been in Qatar and so on again. We will see rights established under major global events. We've built uh, indeed a partnership with the C40 group of cities in dialogue with us and the Gulfs to have clean streets zero emission buildings to provide housing and infrastructure for everybody. And we are actually, we have a G20 with the thanks to my previous president and the DGB um, that uh, has actually acknowledged labour rights in supply chains and has said that rights violations cannot be part of the competition. Now they must deliver. Now they must deliver. And we are tackling inequality with our wages campaigns. You heard the successes this week. Africa, Central America, Asia. We demand that wages at the minimum level be taken out of competition and with social protection everywhere be the floor for collective bargaining. That's our fight. I will say, though, that tax evasion is destroying the finances of the vital public services. It's destroying the money we need for infrastructure. I come from the public sector. I know the value of the fights that unions have put up to secure those services for everybody, and we will not give up. Our Danish host, Lisetta, a wonderful woman, a fantastic leader you've met this week, initiated a new tax initiative yesterday and with our partners in the GAFs, Lisette, we will follow this up. But I want to tell you that the ITUC, despite all you might hear, is more transparent and more democratic than ever. Never before has the ITUC had public plans about a four-year strategy that we investigate every year and endorse for the next year to actually show what we want to do. And it's been very successful. And our planning process will be based on the mandate you deliver. I'm passionate about a lot of things, you can hear that. But I can tell you as your General Secretary, it's not my movement, it's yours. And the mandate you deliver on Friday will be the planning process for the next four years. And, and democracy for me is not in meetings. I love you all and I love congresses, but it's not in meetings. It's in our workplaces, it's side by side with our unions, and indeed it's taking those demands then through our structures to the meeting rooms where we actually deliver the governance of the organisation. The finances are secure and we built new internal infrastructure. We've actually built our own global organising centre on a shoestring and we want to expand it everywhere. We built the Just Transition Centre to help Labor negotiate the future at the table. We want to expand that to technologically uh, challenged areas now, as well as climate. We built Equal Times, that magnificent digital newspaper that reports on your stories, on the stories of injustice around the world. And I built the elected leaders group and now it's in the rules. All of our leaders, our, our president, our deputy presidents, our deputy secretaries, both at the, national, the global and the regional level and their presidents at the regional level will come together 
as we all do now, but without the regional uh, uh, structures three times a year. We will make sure that the oversight that I need in support of your mandate is there. And I'm very proud of uh, working with our elected leaders. And I want to talk to the GUFs about how we involve them as well. Because if we want to be one movement, then it has to go beyond our two meetings every year, brothers and sisters, or even my calling in on your offices or on the phone. We need to find the structures that will make it work. Because you know what we have to fight for, a new social contract, social protection for everybody, for everybody, minimum living wages, collective bargaining, just transitions and our vital public services. Please, please read the statement and when you pass it on Friday, know that that's what you've laid down, the four pillars and the detail under those, peace, democracy and rights regulating economic power, the uh, global shifts that require the just transitions for workers and their families, and equality. That's for the future. But I'm going to tell you it will take intergenerational solidarity to win. I'm so excited to see many young leaders here, but you are not in big enough numbers. You are not in big enough numbers. We need you. We need the intergenerational leadership the solidarity, the fighting capacity and the energy of our young people to build the future. And I make a pledge and I ask you to make a pledge to our young leaders that when we come back here in four years time, when I stand with you and I actually say we built the movement to 250 million people, I want young people by our side, young people. So I commit to you that if you elect me, the next, the next leadership will be a transition to a younger generation. And indeed, I want to say to you that the post-election divisions that you're all concerned about, and understandably so, won't be there on my leadership. There is, I'm Australian, elections are elections, but you are all part of a family and we have respect and love and solidarity for each other. So if I win, I will work with all of you to build workers' power, to change the rules, to bring back social justice in a democratic world we can be proud of. I stand with workers, you stand with workers, the ITUC stands with workers. I humbly ask for your support, solidarity. Obrigado. A Sharon falou por 20 minutos. A Susana também terá agora 20 minutos. 20 minutos. Cher camarade, je suis heureuse d'être ici et de pouvoir me présenter à vous. En l'absence de règles claires pour la compétition démocratique, beaucoup des affiliés n'ont pas obtenu les informations et la possibilité de connaître mon programme. Cela peut être normal dans une organisation très jeune comme la CSI, mais nous devons nous engager pour améliorer son fonctionnement interne. C'est cela n'est pas normal que tout le monde n'a pas assez aux mêmes informations par rapport à la vie démocratique de notre organisation. Je reviens à moi. J'ai commencé mon activité dans le syndicat de la métallurgie, puis dans le syndicat de l'agriculture et de l'alimentation, une expérience formidable avec les multinationales et les questions de l'alimentation. Pendant les huit dernières années, 
que j'étais secrétaire général de la Confédération générale italienne du travail, la CGL. J'ai dirigé une organisation de plus de 5 millions d'affiliés, pluriel, complexe, qui a toujours essayé de rejoindre l'unité avec les organisations italiennes CISL et WIL. Ma direction a toujours été impruntée de collégialité et de collaboration. Je n'ai jamais cru que le secrétaire général puisse être un homme ou une femme seul au pouvoir. Il s'agit de la démocratie, de la transparence, mais aussi du fait que nous devons toujours nous rappeler que nous représentons les travailleurs et les travailleuses. Comment pouvoir faire cela dans une organisation de deuxième niveau, une organisation composée d'organisations comme est la CLC Ce sont les organisations nationales, les affiliés, qui peuvent toujours décider leur engagement dans l'organisation. Les liens avec les fédérations globales et les organisations régionales sont le cœur de cette nouvelle approche. Je crois qu'il est clair que la démocratie, la transparence, le respect et la participation sont les éléments principaux de mon engagement pour la CSI. En ce qui concerne la participation, il est indispensable que la CSI contribue à renforcer les affiliés, les régionales, qui doivent effectivement faire partie de la direction. J'ai entendu de Sharon qu'elle est d'accord sur cela. Alors pourquoi cela n'a pas fait, a été fait pendant les autres ans de sa direction Et le même discours est valable pour les jeunes dirigeants pour la future direction. Et le même discours est valable pour les jeunes dirigeants pour la future direction. Pourquoi cela n'a pas été fait Et la pluralité des dirigeants des pays en développement je suis fier, en ce sens, d'avoir dit à Charan qu'il n'y a pas de possibilité de partager entre nous les postes de secrétaire général et président. Il n'est pas possible de changer les règles en cours de route, mais surtout parce que c'est le tour de l'Afrique et parce que le président est le représentant des affiliés, de tous les affiliés, pas d'une équipe ou de l'autre ou de la secrétaire générale. La CSI est une organisation jeune qui a 12 ans et que nous avons la responsabilité d'améliorer. Il faudra le faire dans une période plus compliquée et difficile pour les travailleurs et les travailleuses. Le néolibéralisme, la globalisation sans règle, la financiarisation de l'économie, les marchés avant tout avec des attaques aux conditions du travail et à la protection sociale. Des attaques aussi aux conditions du monde. Le changement climatique est un problème aujourd'hui et pas du futur. Le mouvement syndical doit soutenir une transition juste dans la CSI et dans tous les pays. Les conséquences de ce changement sont évidentes pour le monde du travail, mais en particulier pour les femmes. Augmentation du travail précaire, le travail informel et la mise en question du fait qu'un travailleur est un travailleur, peu importe sa nationalité, sa religion, son statut ou sa couleur de peau. La globalisation a favori la libre circulation des marchandises et du travail, mais pas la libre circulation des travailleurs. La croissance des partis de droite, du populisme, des nationalismes sont à la base de la décision de fermer les frontières, mais aussi du fait que la migration s'est vécue comme un problème pour les travailleurs. L'idée de pouvoir revenir aux États nationaux n'est pas seulement un problème pour l'Europe, mais aussi pour le multilatéralisme et pour les organisations mondiales les retours à un monde divisé entre les plus riches et les plus pauvres. La migration n'est pas seulement liée au thème des réfugiés, des réfugiés qui arrivent en Europe, mais aussi et surtout à la circulation des personnes dans les continents et les syndicats. Les syndicats doivent défendre l'accueil et l'hospitalité. L'intégration et l'inclusion doivent être notre choix. Nous devons défendre les droits des migrés, mais aussi de ne pas être forcés à migrer. Now I speak in English. Let me thank again the Danish trade unions for hosting the Congress and for such a wonderful hospitality. I want to thank in particular the ITUC staff who are working to make this Congress successful. <laughs> to do all this, to change the rules, we need to empower trade unions more cooperation among trade unions and all tools to organize workers. We know that the world of work is under attack. 
our comrades around the world are intimidated, imprisoned, or even killed. In this respect, it's very worrying that employers and government have decided in ILO to close the case of Guatemala. This is a clear sign of the aggressive attitude of employers. I had already mentioned the role of the workers' group in ILO and the need to involve affiliates in the discussion about the crisis of tripartism and the reform of multilateral organization. They are fundamental instruments to empower national trade unions. Our aim is for sure protecting the freedom of association and the right of, of collective bargaining. We live in a world where eight white men hold the wealth of 3.7 billion people. We are not talking about countries, but enterprise. It's multinational that decided the future of digitalization. They own the technologies. So we can't be against progress. We have to be aware this that the technology is not neutral. So we need to be prepared to negotiate this technology, this technology that affects workers' condition, working time, contractual arrangement, and so on. As for digitalization, we cannot speak of transition. Changing is happening now. Life and world of work are changing now. So if you want to defend and qualify work, we need to prepare and improve our capacities to do collective agreements. At the same, at the same time, we cannot accept the privatization of public service by multinational. Public services are the main tool for social protection, for security, and to fight against poverty. For the historical role played by the trade unions, the subject matter now is how to prefer, preserve the force of collective bargaining. A strong collective bargaining system, freedom to organize and right to industrial action and strike are a precondition for trade unions' growth. We don't have to be afraid of change. We have to be able to negotiate how this change will happen. We also need to be aware that new technologies can polarize and far further divided, divide the world of work. We must fight this. We value the work that Global Union Federation have done in Bangladesh and in other countries, together with national affiliates. The work that has been done together with ILO in Qatar is significant. Now it's necessary to build via there a free trade union organization. Every, everywhere, we need to defend the freedom of association and apply the ILO conventions and recommendations. Modern and old forms of slavery are a serious problem everywhere, including in Europe and in Italy, my country. We are fighting hard against gangs master and forced labor. We are organizing workers, negotiating, negotiating with national collective agreements, and we are proud of having achieved the law against gang masters that allows to defend workers. Collective bargaining is a fundamental instrument to empower workers and increase salaries. We need to increase minimum wage around the world with the participation of trade unions, but all campaign must be agreed and implemented together with national unions, defeating work poverty, precarious work, and promoting transition into, fo into formal work must be a priority. Wage and minimum wage are also a question of gender. We need equal pay for women all around the world. Gender equality is a possible goal, also by improving access to social infrastructure, public service, and adequate policies to achieve this. This is why, next year, we need to adopt an ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. I would like to say much more, but as time, the time is limited, I would like to close with a message to you, affiliates, the earth and richness of this organization. Struggle for better working condition is the best possible engagement for the present and for the future. 
It's about changing the world for the better and about shaping the future with the possibility to strengthen solidarity and getting workers out of fear. And I2C itself should be like this, a place where everybody feels free to speak, have a discuss discussion even when we have different ideas. The fact that colleagues who are not feeling free to speak and make declaration is something that should never happen again. A few words. A few words about our Congress. All organiza organizations have rules, and the respect of rules means respect for each other. The only way to preserve unity. And our Constitution is based on the concept of consensus. This is why a vote cannot be repeated, but it's possible to find a consensual solution. On this, I have some ideas, and I am ready to discuss with FLCAO. I2C has to grow. I2C has to grow. But to achieve this and have more affiliates, we need the free, autonomous, and independent trade unions, and then an organization where women and men are free to say what they think without any kind of pressure. Workers too often feel alone and isolated. We need to tell them not to be afraid and to brave. This is why I am asking for your support to change and be, be united in solidarity in our diversity, to promote freedom and democracy in every corner of the world. El final en español. Bueno, quiero acabar mi intervención confirmando mi compromiso. confirmando mi compromiso para una CSI unida, una casa abierta para todas las afiliadas, una organización de sindicatos libres, democráticos, independientes, una organización al servicio de los derechos de trabajadores y de trabajadoras. Luchamos unidos, reivindicamos la centralidad del trabajo por construir una sociedad más justa. ¡Viva la CSI! Obrigado. Agora eu chamaria a líder da Comissão de Verificação de Poderes, que vai nos apresentar aqui agora o procedimento sobre o processo eleitoral. Thank you, President. Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, this is uh, an important day, and I think it's uh, really important that we show both our candidates in the election of General Secretary uh, a great respect. And I hope that this day will be characterized by unity rather than division, and I wish both candidates the best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before moving on to our report, and I will uh, go through the procedure for the voting, uh, I just want to say that yesterday the Congress requested the Credentials Committee to further examine the procedure surrounding the vote on the amendment submitted by the AFL-CIO. We have just started a discussion in the Credentials Committee and I have had a first meeting with the chair of the Standing Orders Committee. This is a complicated issue, and it's also an important one, 
as it concerns our Constitution. Um, the fact that Congress decided to refer the issue to the committee recognizes this. Yesterday, our committee needed to focus on the process and the preparations of the election of General Secretary, but we will continue our discussion this afternoon and report back to Congress. I just wanted to say that all issues cannot be solved by a constitution. I have been a trade union leader for 20 years now. I know this. And you know this, and we all know this. There are times when we have to take joint responsibility in order to move forward. We need to listen to each other, respect each other, and truly try to find unity. In this, each and every one of us have a great responsibility. So now I want to move on to uh, the report from the committee. And I will read it slowly so that everything can be translated properly. Um, the Credentials Committee took note of the procedure for the election of the General Secretary as recommended by the Standing Orders Committee and adopted by Congress yesterday. As Chair of the Credentials Committee, it is my ro role to inform you on how this procedure will practically be, be implemented. I want to repeat what I mentioned yesterday. The Credentials Committee strongly urge, urges delegation leaders to avoid voting by proxy to limit the risk of irregularities. The Credentials Committee has agreed on a setup of the voting room you should see a plan of the room behind me on the screen. No? Can we, can we have um, a, a picture of, um, of the voting room, please? Thank you very much. Uh, voting will take place from 10.45, or when I'm uh, finished this report, I will go directly to the vo uh, voting room. So we will have voting between 10.45 a.m. to uh, 1.15 p.m. Uh, today. Please come as early as possible. And after 1.15 p.m., those who have not presented themselves uh, at the voting room will no longer be allowed to vote. So please come as early as possible. Last night, I have verified and validated the ballot papers with a stamp and a signature in presence of Giacomo Barbieri and Natalia Klimova, both members of the Credentials Committee. We placed each ballot in a sealed envelope bearing the name of the organization. In front of the voting room, the members of the Credentials Committee will take note of voters who present themselves prior to the closing time of the vote. Members of the Credentials Committee will also be able to respond to any questions or to address any possible issues regarding the voting process. Hereafter, voters will be grouped in regional lines in front of the voting room to facilitate the flow of voters going in. Right before entering the room, ITUC staff will check the status of delegates as delegation leaders or nominated and accredited delegates with a valid proxy from their delegation leader. To safeguard the secrecy of the vote, no use of phones or cameras will be allowed in the voting room. Once verified, delegation leaders or those with a valid proxy will be allowed to enter the room and guided to their regional desk to receive the envelope containing their ballot. 
An additional desk is foreseen inside the voting room to address any concerns of voters. Upon reception of their ballot, voters, voters are requested to go into one of the four voting booths and vote by, making, uh, by marking in the box next to the name of the candidate they want to support. After this, they are requested to fold their ballot, leave the booth and, their, and cast their vote in the ballot box before leaving the room on the other side. I think it's important that everyone is listening now so that everything is correct and democratic, okay? Um, after the closure of the voting process, Michael Finn of the Australian ACTU and Jesus Gallego from UGT Spain the two observers nominated by the two candidates will be invited to enter the room. The notary will then count the votes under the observation of the chairs of the credentials and standing orders committees and the two representatives of the candidates in such a way as to guarantee the secrecy of the vote. In case there is a doubt about the valid, vali, validity of a vote, the notary will fold the ballot paper in such a way as the number of votes cannot be seen and will request the shares of the two committees to decide on the validity of the ballot. The Credentials Committee also decided that the counting should be done offline with a standard calculator and that the votes should be counted at least two times. In case of any discrepancy between the results, the vote should be counted at least three times and until there is no doubt as to the result. The notary will inform me as chair of the Credentials Committee of the result of the vote. The ballot papers once counted are then kept under the supervision of the notary until such time as the report of the Credentials Committee confirming the outcome of the ballot is adopted by Congress and will be destroyed immediately after. I will then inform the two candidates of the outcome of elections by a direct phone call. First, Sharon Burrows as incumbent general secretary and immediately after Susanna Camuso. As soon as both candidates uh, agree, the result will be, will be published on the Congress website. If a recounting is asked by one of the candidates, the decision of recounting the votes will be taken by the Credentials Committee. The voting will take place in a room next to the cafe, uh, catering area. It's that direction, just behind you. I2C staff will be able, uh, available to guide delegates. And I would like to uh, now invite the notaries that will oversee the election up on stage so that they can just introduce themselves to the Congress. Please, notaries. Thank you, Eva. Hello, you. Um, my name is uh, Joachim Munk. I'm an uh, independent state authorized public and accountant. And uh, together with my colleague Dide, we will uh, monitor the voting process as well as we will do the counting of the votes. Based on our work, we will uh, issue a report which uh, we will provide to the committee. Thank you. Let us demonstrate that the I2C is a democratic organization that we can have frank discussions and take tough decisions, but that, we have, but that we do so in solidarity and with respect for different perspectives. 
The Credentials Committee wishes both candidates success and let us today celebrate democracy. I declare the vote open. Thank you very much. Bom, está declarada aberta o processo eleitoral. Vamos encerrar essa plenária, né? Ah, o painel ainda? Sim. Ah, é? Mas as pessoas vão, vão, vão votar? Carl, você vai para o panel. Ele está dirigindo o panel. Carl, Peter. Carl está dirigindo o panel e depois você vai para o debate. Ok. Vamos, então, os, os re representantes de cada central sindical é, vão... É, participar do processo eleitoral, os outros permanecem em plenário, que nós vamos dar continuidade ao plenário agora. Ok? Carl Peter. <risos> ok? Please, can you all be seated? It's only one from el every delegation going voting. So please, can you all be seated again? Yeah, you are sitting, I know. But there is, a, I can say, a few in the back who are standing. Like 350 people. So, let's continue. As you know, we are now moving forward to the debate and discussion on the just transition for workers. One of the key questions for the global trade union movement of today. How do we secure our members in the transition from a carbon dioxide dependent world to a carbon free world? How do we see so our members don't lose their jobs, don't lose their uh, possibility in the future to earn money and have secure lives? We work that uh, very hard in Sweden, and Sweden uh, is one of the countries in the world that will be carbon neutral first. Well, I think we beat most of you. 2040, our government decided, our parliament decided that we should be a, a carbon neutral country, and it makes a yet big, big, big transitions. I give you two examples. One of the biggest polluters in Sweden are the steel industry. And the steel industry, to melt steel, use a lot of coal. Actually, 13% of all carbon dioxide in Sweden is from the steel industry. And we want to have a good steel industry also in the future. That's a fantastic income from our uh, export. So we try to beat Japan on being most, uh, the best steel in the world. And we have competition also from China. But it uh, creates 13% of all the pollution of carbon dioxide in Sweden. So now we started a project to get a trade union, employer, companies and the state to try to remove coal from steel with hydrogen. And now we have invested 100 million euro in a, in a test uh, arrangement and invited Rengo to come there and uh, see if we can change from coal to clean hydrogen to make steel. And we, if we are beating all you, we can compete with a clean coal first in the world in a couple of years. Secondly, most of carbon dioxide is from trucks and cars, from transportation. And you know, we are all gasoline, diesel uh, uh, users and producers. 
an enormous amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from transportation. And most of the solution will be by, by uh, batteries, we know that, but not all. And we risk of losing a lot of jobs if we can't have a just transition. So now we actually start to use uh, from our wood, petrol and diesel to our uh, cars and trucks. So already today, 2018, if you go to Sweden and fill up your car, 35% of the fuel is from our wood. And that's fantastic resource, so 35% of it's already fixed. But we need to go further on. In a few years, I hope that we can take all uh, diesel and uh, gas gasoline away from our car and drive it almost 100% on Swedish fantastic wood in the cars instead. That will create new jobs and of course it will also be a just transition for people. That's two examples from Sweden. We are working very hard with that. And now invite the panel to come up here. So please, Mr. Hassan Youssef, Laurent Park, uh, Eric Mansi, Simo Stoli, uh, Lenin Hernandez Navas, and uh, finally on the second page. No, you, uh, no, it was all, uh, yeah, Lena Carr. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we we, uh, we start with uh, some examples from Canada. So please, Mr. Hassan Youssef, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, comrades and friends. I think the discussion we're about to have here, of course, is complemented by the incredible work that's already started in Poland regarding our comrades who are there in attendance on our behalf <clears throat> to add to our voice in regard to what the Climate Change Conference will determine in the next two weeks in Poland. On behalf of the Canadian Labour Congress, I'm pleased to join you here this morning to share with you, of course, our efforts in regard to the broader efforts around the world with our trade union colleagues as how we tackle this incredible issue that's before us. Canada's largest province phased out coal power in 2014, went from 53 smog days to zero days shortly after. We know the impact the smog have on the health of workers and their families, and especially young children. School children can't play outside, and vulnerable population, of course, have to stay indoors when smog alert, of course, are happening in our community. When the federal government, of course, made the announcement that Canada's unions were supportive of the phase out of coal, but we were clear that affected workers and their communities must not, must not ex be expected to shoulder the burden of this phase-out alone. Governments and employers have a responsibility to ensure that workers and communities are supported during this important period. Workers need access, of course, to reskilling and income support. Comrades, I would be quite happy to not continue my, my presentation if we can have some respect for the speakers that's going to speak after me. Workers need access and reskilling and income support as they transition to new employment and a pathway to define retirement for those nearing the end of their careers. And community centers around industries need an investment to create new jobs and opportunities which will allow them to survive and thrive after coal plants and coal mines are phased out in their community. After much effort on part of Canadian unions, our federal government announced, of course, a just transition task force for the Canadian coal-powered workers and their communities across our country. This is the first in our history. Our minister made the announcement of the UN Climate Change Conference in Bonn last year. This task force, this was co-chaired by myself and a prominent environmentalist, began, of course, its work throughout the spring 
and through the summer of course this year. We immediately set out across the country holding town hall in communities that still burn coal to generate electricity. We met with affected workers and their unions, employers in both the generating plants and the coal mines, local governments, Chamber of Commerce, and Community and Economic Development Group. And we listened. We listened to their hopes, their fears, and their plans, of course, for the future. We heard what they need from the government and successfully to transition from the coal industry. Despite their uncertainty and their frustrations about the future might hold, these communities welcome us. They hosted us in their centers and their town halls and they shared their lives with us during the period we were there. They were gracious and they were honest. We made our recommendations, of course, to our federal government about what is needed to support workers and their community through this transition. And despite having a variety of voices on the task force, including employers' representatives, environmentalists, city councillors, affected from the communities where the coal phase-out will take place, as well as strong union representation, Canadian coal workers, our recommendation to government were unanimous by our task force. I think this is because, of course, we took the time, the time away from our families, to travel the country and to really listen to the affected workers and their families and their communities. We're expecting to see investment in the 2019 budget that is going to happen sometime next year. One thing that was clear from our travels that was not one size would fit all in regard to the phase out of coal in our country. The different provinces have different structures and electricity generation. In some places, it's a group of private utilities that own the coal generation and the coal mines. In some provinces, we have Crown Corporation public ownership of the utility. These different structures affect how easily workers can be re-employed during this transition. Each community needs different type of investment to replace the job loss they will be faced with. Our recommendations are centered around the idea that affected workers must be involved in these decisions and communities must be able to shape their own plans for the transition. Just transition is a matter of fairness. It is also an issue of pragmatism. We need a broad-based consensus that fighting climate change is a priority and fundamentally reorganizing our economy is to ensure ambitious climate action is something that we must and we can do. We won't get the broad consensus if unions don't take steps to bring workers and community together. We have a fundamental role to play in regard to this responsibility. If workers and community don't believe that they are being supported through this transition and they feel that they will be left to fend for themselves, they will understandably, of course, resist any transition of government to take their jobs away. We will see an increasing polarization and diminished ambition on climate change. And we know that how this can lead to the rise of the right wing and populist governments, which hurts workers in all kinds of ways. So we have to work hard to build trust and to broaden the consensus, to fight the polarization, ultimately to take the ambitious climate action. We need to save the planet and workers' livelihood. Last but not least, my friends, I can say without a doubt, in regard to the responsibility of co-chairing the task force, I have experienced firsthand the challenge that workers face and their ambivalence about the future. It is their unions that they have confidence in that will help them figure out the pathway to a better future. I know the work of the ITUC and all its unions around the world are critical to the success in how we save this planet. If we fail on this most basic principle of a just transition to workers and their community, we will fail to achieve the objective in setting a different path to make this planet hospitable and the future for working people. I can say in regard to my responsibility, we will do our part in Canada to ensure we meet the climate objective of the Paris Agreement without a doubt but it will take tremendous effort of our movement, 
our government and the industry to achieve this objective. Thank you so much. And uh, once again, comrades in the, in the back, if you want to have a conference, uh, go outside, please, so we can have Congress in here. Please, don't, uh, people have uh, worked a lot to prepare speeches here for everybody. I will uh, then now invite uh, Lars Park from New Zealand to continue in their struggle for just transition. Matafaura is my mountain, Oho is my river, Ngati Pikiao are my people. My mountain greets your mountain, my river greets your river, and my people through me greet you. Ngamihi mai oha, kia kauta katoa. Just transition is a framework practiced by indigenous peoples and co-opted by the trade union movement to encompass protecting and supporting the interests of the working people in the transition to a new carbon future. A future that includes new technologies, globalization and democratic shifts that will impact on all our lives. A just transition process needs to be fair, equitable and inclusive, which means careful planning with communities, regions and sectors. Working people in unions understand that the effects of climate change will not be evenly felt, but will impact most harshly on poor and vulnerable populations, which includes Indigenous and First Nations people of the world. One of the first acts of the New Zealand Labour Coalition government was to stop the allocation of licenses for gas and oil exploration. And yes, for five minutes, we celebrated. But now comes a hard part when we must systematically transition from coal and gas to electricity and low carbon emissions. Here too, the Union for Oil and Gas Workers, Taranaki tribal groups and the government working together believe that this process could be a blueprint for the future and the changes across other industries. Unions also agreed with the government on the need for a climate commission as a core agency with a mandate to lead a low carbon transformation in the public sector as well as driving an integrated approach to meet international commitments. In October of this year, the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions, with the support of the Just Transition Centre, held a Just Transition Roundtable in New Zealand. Our Ministers for Climate Change, for Workplace Relations and Safety, and the Minister for Energy and Resources met with unionists, environmentalists, employers and Indigenous people to begin the Just Transition discussion. For the Indigenous people of New Zealand, as with our Pacific brothers and sisters, moving off our land to higher ground or even moving to other islands of the Pacific is a fact that must be faced. Māori tribal groups must consider the possibilities of moving their ancestral meeting houses from coastal areas to the hill country, which can happen quite easily if the land in question belongs to your people. But what happens if it doesn't? The loss of an ancestral home will mean a loss of land and connections to Mother Earth, but to also exclude Indigenous and First Nations people from the just transition process will be a loss of mana and dignity. 
Remember, Matafaura is my mountain, Oho is my river, and Ngāti Pikiao are my people. And like all indigenous people, we must be heard. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and thank you everybody. Now it's uh, quiet and, and good in here again. Uh, I call now for Eric Mansi, who is representing uh, Sestrar in Rwanda. Welcome. Cher Kamarad, Pour assurer une juste transition dans un contexte d'innovation et de développement technologique et surtout adresser aux défis nombreux que nous avons dans nombreux pays africains, dont mon pays fait partie. Certes, la digitalisation et l'innovation technologique a créé un sentiment de doute et d'appréhension car la perception est qu'elle occasionnerait des pertes de plusieurs emplois, que l'humain perdrait le contrôle du marché du travail et pourrait se retrouver aux mains des robots et à la merci de l'intelligence artificielle. Pire qu'il serait contrôlé par des algorithmes. Vrai ou pas, mais en tout cas certains cabinets assez sérieux ont fait des études et l'ont démontré. Les pays en développement dont la majorité se retrouvent en Afrique et dont mon pays fait partie, en dépit d'autres défis et des enjeux majeurs que sont la pauvreté, les conflits, les conflits et les guerres, le chômage élevé des jeunes, une économie informelle très large, la fuite de la main d'œuvre et des cerveaux auxquels nous devons faire face, nous sommes obligés aujourd'hui d'aller vite et de rattraper d'autres parties du monde où ils sont assez bien avancés au point de vue technologique afin de pouvoir survivre dans ce monde globalisé et impitoyable. Je viens d'un pays qui est applaudi sur le plan international dû à ses performances économiques et au développement rapide du pays, mais aussi, entre autres, par la volonté manifeste du gouvernement de se lancer dans une vaste campagne d'accès à la connexion Internet à haut débit, à l'innovation technologique, à la digitalisation de tous les services. Cependant, il faut se poser la question si cette ces innovations et ce développement technologique répondent aux besoins réels du pays Telle est la question qui devrait être posée. Elle reste ainsi posée quant à savoir son réel impact sur le marché du travail et dans la création d'un emploi, emploi de qualité et suffisamment productif. Son réel impact à réduire la pauvreté et les inégalités. Ces deux mondes différents qui, 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 qui se confrontent. Celui, d'une part, d'un milieu urbain assez bien connecté, ou même en milieu rural où vous avez des agriculteurs connectés sur leur GSM et qui reçoivent à temps, en temps réel les données météorologiques et les, produits de, les, les, les prix des produits agricoles et contrôlent à distance l'irrigation de leurs champs à partir de leur smartphone. Et d'un autre côté, un cultivateur qui continue à utiliser sa petite roue traditionnelle. Certes, le constat a été fait que le développement technologique a sensiblement modifié la nature de certains emplois et ont redéfini les relations professionnelles et changé l'environnement du dialogue social. La digitalisation et l'innovation technologique, si elle est parfaitement régulée et même apprivoisée, peut créer beaucoup d'emplois de qualité durables, productifs et basés sur des compétences bien pointues. Comment le faisons-nous dans le cadre du dialogue social Dans un cadre, dans un dialogue social apaisé et constructif, nous nous assurons que le gouvernement assure son rôle régulateur, transparent et pas seulement facilitant et répondant aux désiderata des investisseurs et des multinationales. Investir dans des changements technologiques adaptés aux contextes nationaux et aux besoins réels et non pas investir dans des éléphants blancs. Mettre en place des politiques cohérentes d'emploi axées sur une haute intensité de main-d'œuvre 
une forte industrialisation et d'autres projets générateurs d'emplois durables et décents. Reformer la politique de l'éducation pour la rendre plus adéquate aux besoins du marché du travail en anticipant sur le développement de la technologie et des compétences requises. Assurer un transfert de technologie et de décourager la rétention des connaissances afin de ne pas continuer à être subordonnés à ces pays dits avancés technologiquement. Assurer la protection des données et la vie privée et ne pas le vendre au premier venu, comme on le voit dans le cadre de certains investissements, comme euh, euh, certains groupes d'investissement Alibaba, euh, Amazon et, et d'autres. C'est dans ce contexte que nous appelons à la solidarité syndicale, à préserver l'unité. Et comme on l'a surtout répété durant ce quatrième congrès, soyons unis, soyons forts, car tous ensemble, je crois que nous pourrons gagner. Et ce travail a été fait grâce à un travail de support reçu de la part de la CSI et dans le cadre d'une solidarité internationale très vaste. Voilà pourquoi très souvent nous le répétons, nous sommes fiers d'appartenir à cette organisation. Car grâce à cette organisation, nous avons reçu le support de l'appui international de plusieurs pays, que ce soit de la Belgique, du Danemark, de la Suède, de la France, du Canada, d'Afrique de l'Ouest et de l'Est, avec qui nous travaillons dans le cadre de sortir les travailleurs de l'économie informelle et d'assurer une transition de l'informel au formel et dans ce cadre, en traitant le, le thème d'aujourd'hui, assurer tous ensemble une juste transition. N'oublions pas que l'avenir du travail devrait être l'avenir de l'humanité et nous devons remettre l'humain au centre de tout et revenir aux fondamentaux tels que mentionné dans la déclaration de Fidel Delphi. Le travail n'est pas une marchandise. Que vive la solidarité et ensemble nous vaincrons. Je vous remercie. Oh, merci beaucoup, Eric. Um, we move forward on then, uh, the difficult question how we help uh, people in the so-called platform economy, platform workers. And to help us there, we have an expert from uh, from the Irish Union of, uh, of Journalists, uh, it's Seamus Dooley. The floor is yours. Ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again. Fail again, fail better. Those words from the Nobel laureate Samuel Beckett sustained the Irish trade union movement during our 20-year campaign to have the right of Irish freelance workers in journalism and the creative arts restored. Ultimately, we learned, and we learned from our best failures. The ILO Freedom of Association and Protection of the Right to Organize Convention enunciates the principle of equality for all workers, and that includes platform workers and freelance workers in all sectors. Freelance workers are of particular importance to my union, the National Union of Journalists of UK and Ireland, and to the, my federation, the International Federation of Journalists. The seminal declaration of Philadelphia adopted in 1944 declared the right of all human beings to pursue both their material well-being and their spiritual development in conditions of freedom and dignity, of economic security and of equal opportunity. At this stage, could I say that I don't know if some of you can hear me, but I can hear you. For the labour movement, the challenge comes from the primacy granted to competition law and the belief that the market is supreme that all public policy must first give regard to the value of the marketplace at all, at all costs, in human, including human dignity and the right of equality and freedom of association. Now, at a time when atypical working has become the norm, has become typical in many industries, 
there cannot be what we call a just transition without vigorously asserting the universal right of all workers to be collectively represented regardless of their employment relationship. In Ireland, the Competition Authority determined that the publication of fees guides, collective agreements, or the setting of minimum rates of pay for freelance workers was a breach of competition law, a form of price fixing which would distort the market. They refused to recognize freelance writers, photographers, musicians, voiceover actors as workers, insisting instead that they were business undertakings regulated by competition law. Long-standing collective agreements were abandoned. Vulnerable workers, low-paid workers, many of them women workers, workers of, in vulnerable positions, were left to the vagaries of the marketplace. This is not some sort of theory, some academic problem. A trade union a colleague belonging to my sister union, SIP2, faced criminal proceedings in the Irish court with the threat not just of punitive fines, but of imprisonment. Last year, after a, de a campaign of two decades, we succeeded in changing competition law, which recognises the rights of categories of freelance workers to be collectively represented. And it also provides a statutory framework for other freelance workers to seek trade union representation. That was a significant achievement and one which we must celebrate because if we do not sing our own song of praise and celebration, no one else is going to sing it for us. A grassroots parliamentary campaign supported by a legal strategy guided by the distinguished lawyer John Hendy QC and a formal complaint to the ILO ultimately led to a unanimous decision in our favour in Parliament. By developing links across the political spectrum, we secured key political support, exploiting as well the prevailing political position of the government. Working with the ICTU, the NUJ, SIP2, the Musicians Union and Equity never gave up, even after the collapse of social dialogue and in opposition from the European Commission, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Yes, our right to represent collective, uh, collectively vulnerable workers was opposed by no less a person than Christine Lagarde herself. The Competition Authority is charged with regulating banking. Instead of regulating banking, which brought the Irish economy to its knees, the Competition Authority decided to go after a few freelance photographers in the Irish Midlands. The setting of rates by the National Union of Journalists for three photographers in the Midlands might lead to the collapse of the Irish economy. In the end, we succeeded. We succeeded through the power of solidarity, persistence, effective lobbying, skillful legal argument, and utilizing every avenue open to us, from parliamentary motions and petitions to publicity and through a direct complaint at both at European level and at the ILO. And here I acknowledge the support of Sharon Burroughs and the ITUC in that campaign. Ours was a local battle, but as so often happens, it is a local battle with global implications. It is no coincidence that at the ILO earlier this year, the employers group resisted reference to the report of the Irish government to that new legislation. That, I suspect, was for fear of contagion. We now await the adjudication of our report to the European Committee on Social Rights, which will be published early in the new year. The report is concluded. We cannot yet announce the results, but I can say that I would predict profound and helpful uh, implications of that judgment. A just transition must include a readjustment of the balance between competition law and employment rights and can only be achieved by embracing all workers within our global movement and that must include freelance workers in the most precarious of sectors including the platform workers. Thank you for your attention. And now we move on to, uh, to Costa Rica.
to Lenin Hernandez Navas, uh, Union Advocacy in Costa Rica, and, and uh, especially including uh, climate action uh, for, for uh, goal uh, eight. Uh, in the GB, GB. So please, uh, please uh, Lenin, come up. Muy buenos días, estimadas y estimados colegas congresistas. Eh, si yo les hago una pregunta a cada uno de ustedes, de que si como, como representantes sindicales vemos necesario la implementación de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable, quemarse en la mano, ¿cuántos creen en ello? Les hago la pregunta de nuevo, ¿cuántos creen que es necesario la implementación de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable? Nosotros como sindicalistas... Una pregunta para ver si me están poniendo atención. <risa> eh, en primera instancia, compañeras y compañeros, agradecer a toda la parte logística, operativa, organizativa, financiera y sobre todo este trato fraterno que hemos recibido todas las representaciones eh, aquí presentes en este cuarto Congreso Mundial de la CSI. En segundo lugar, decirles que efectivamente el movimiento sindical costarricense está trabajando con AINCO para implementar los, o los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable en nuestro país. En nuestro país, porque de repente alguno no sabe dónde está Costa Rica ni de dónde viene su servidor, contarles que Costa Rica es un pequeño país de Centroamérica de 51 mil kilómetros cuadrados. En el mes de septiembre estuvimos recibiendo al costarricense número 5 millones. Nuestro país está bañado por dos, por dos océanos, y, de, y tenemos el 25% de nuestras áreas totalmente protegidas a favor de la ecología. Nos han acuñado una frase como que los costarricenses somos muy pura vida. Esa es una cara de la moneda. Pero la otra cara de la moneda es decirles que Costa Rica es el noveno país con más desigualdad social. El 44% de los trabajadores del sector privado, es decir, 700 mil personas, están trabajando bajo el informalismo, no tienen las condiciones mínimas de empleo. El 10,2% de los trabajadores se encuentran totalmente desempleados, es decir, la población está totalmente cesante. Un tercio de la población requiere de algún programa social para efectos de poder subsistir y 1.200.000 personas viven bajo la pobreza y 87.000 familias viven en pobreza extrema, es decir, reciben mensualmente un ingreso de un 25% del salario mínimo. Y aunado a ello, el movimiento sindical costarricense viene saliendo de un movimiento huelguístico por la implementación de políticas fiscales regresivas, lo que ha obligado al Parlamento a buscar la forma de impedir que las organizaciones sindicales podamos organizarnos e ir a huelga. Por lo tanto, están tratando de implementar desde el seno de la Asamblea Legislativa políticas para impedir la huelga y la convención colectiva. Eso estamos viviendo en nuestro país. Sin embargo, el movimiento sindical costarricense está inmerso en la implementación de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable. ¿Y cómo hemos logrado esto? Nosotros como filosofía de trabajo no estamos renunciando a ningún espacio de diálogo y consideramos que sigue siendo el diálogo la mejor herramienta para buscar soluciones y negociaciones. Por tal razón, nosotros logramos, como Movimiento Sindical Costarricense, firmar un acuerdo con el Gobierno de la República en un documento denominado Pacto Nacional por el Avance de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sustentable, con un compromiso expreso del gobierno, mismo que se ha institucionalizado a través de un decreto ejecutivo y ahora este acuerdo tiene fuerza de ley. ¿Cuál es el objetivo nuestro con relación a este, a este pacto que tiene, repito, fuerza de ley? Lo que tratamos es de implementar los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable en el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo. 
también quiero hacer una pequeña gran observación para todos los, nosotros que somos dirigentes sindicales, porque entre muy pronto los gobiernos o algunos políticos y grupos de poder económico van a sentir una gran presión por los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable porque es debilitar su status quo y van a tratar de mandar informes sesgados, informes falsos para efectos de cumplir en el papel lo que no se hace en la realidad. Entonces, nosotros también, junto con un acompañamiento de la CSA e implementar también el objetivo de la Plada para que el desarrollo político, económico, social y ambiental vayan de la mano, hemos logrado concertar un proceso con la academia, con la universidad, para llevar ese control cruzado de la implementación de los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable, sobre todo en el tema de, de transiciones justas. ¿Para qué? Para que la implementación de políticas públicas se logren evidenciar y tener nosotros en la mano esa herramienta para, en el caso de, de tener dicotomías, poder argumentar de un punto de vista técnico y científico los, los eh, de repente, informes sesgados que quisieran presentar. Para finalizar, compañeras y compañeros eh, dirigentes sindicales de los diferentes países del mundo, decirles lo siguiente. Si nosotros queremos devolverle al pueblo del mundo y a los trabajadores del mundo un verdadero reparto de la riqueza, vista la riqueza no en términos materiales, sino en los elementos mínimos de desarrollo humano, es decir, trabajo, vivienda, seguridad alimentaria, seguridad social, salud, pensiones, justicia, igualdad de género y sobre todo tener un ambiente sano y equilibrado, un medio ambiente sano y equilibrado, la única forma es incidir en los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable y creernos nuestra la Agenda 2030 para el bien de toda la clase trabajadora. Así que muchísimas gracias y que viva la clase trabajadora. Muchas gracias, Lenin. Uh, uh, last but not least, we will also look into um, how we work in Europe with one of the big uh, difficulties we have in just transition, and uh, it's uh, the right for refugees and migrant workers. And as you know, we had had a lot of uh, migration to Europe the last years. And here to present uh, what we are doing in Europe is Lina Carr. Lina. Dear delegates, I'm most privileged to be talking to you here today. The European Trade Union Confederation is the umbrella organization in Europe that fights for the workers' rights in Europe. Migration has been a really and extremely divisive topic in Europe in recent years. But just to give you some idea, just a couple of figures, in 2015, there were 244 million international migrants globally. In addition, over 65.5 million people were displaced mainly by conflicts. And displacement due to climate change and disasters has affected 22.5 million since 2008. And just in comparison, inside the European Union, we have approximately 22 million non-EU citizens living in the European member states. That's from 2017. So you can see that the, all the cries of nationalist and xenophobic movements in Europe of Europe being overrun by migrants, threatening our security, threatening our livelihoods and the way of life are exaggerated beyond all belief. 
So we are facing a political crisis when it comes to migration in Europe. Lots of reforms that were proposed by the European Commission have not been taken forward or even worse, have been blocked by member states. In the European trade union movement, we have strenuously asking for rapid action from the EU and from the member states. We have engaged in determined advocacy efforts and work with the EU institutions, with other civil society organizations and also international governmental organizations like ILO, IOM, OECD, OECE, to try to find human and humane solutions to the situation that we are facing in Europe. So from our point of view, what are the important principles? What do we need to do to stop unscrupulous companies, nationalist xenophobic forces playing migrant workers against local workers? For us, the answer is simple. We have to guarantee the equal treatment, regardless of your background, regardless of which country you come from. When you work in the same workplace, when you do the same work, you have to be paid the same, you have to be treated the same. There can be no discrimination. We have advocated for the establishment of safe and legal channels for migrants. We have advocated for more generous asylum policy in Europe. Unfortunately, just two days ago, the European Commission President, Mr. Juncker, has declared that the reform that we've been working on, on European asylum policy, has been shelved. The European Commission will not continue its work. Let's hope that after the elections in Europe next year, the new Commission will pick up the, the baton and actually carry on the work. So integration of refugees, asylum seekers or migrants in the labour market is the key. Without the integration, we cannot have societal integration. Decent treatment of everybody is the key. In Europe, we also have a union uh, migrant net that is a trade union network that continues, has done so and is continuing to be an essential actor in uh, preventing and combating unfair treatment of migrants, also assisting migrants. It's a place where they can go. There is a, a website, there is a phone number, the migrants can call or contact to seek assistance when needed. Clearly, migration is a, a much bigger issue than just integrating the migrants in Europe. We are uh, trying to address these issues also together with the ITUC through the development cooperation policies and working with the European institutions to push them to really concentrate through the development cooperation in creating opportunities and possibilities uh, for people at home so that they are not forced to move from their countries. But also, whether we want to admit it or not, to have successful integration of migrants in Europe, we have to find a way to change the narrative that we hear very often. And we have to find a ways to reassure working people in Europe that the current challenges of the sudden peak in migration can be turned into an opportunity for our societies and for our economies. We all must do more. The challenges for an integrated and unified approach to the migration remains high. And there is a need to further strengthen trade unions' actions in this field at all levels. 
at the EU level, at the national level, at the local level, but also globally. If we work together, we will create a better world and give people the possibility for freely chosen migration and not forced migration. Thank you very much, Lina, and uh, thank you, all panel. Now we, we hear some good work in uh, all of our regions uh, all over the world, and this is something we need to do together in the ITUC family. We, we need, really need a just transition. I also want to say to you that we had a major success in uh, Poland uh, yesterday. You know, they have a climate meeting in Poland, and we stressed for uh, solidarity and just transition declaration. It was made yesterday in Poland and already uh, two pages of uh, countries have signed up. Albania, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Canada, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, uh, um, European Commission, Fiji, Finland, France, uh, Germany, Greece. Um, Secretary of State of the Holy See, I don't know where that is, but it's probably very big. Honduras, Iceland, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Macedonia, Madagascar, Montenegro. I don't want to go through all the countries that actually now signed up for a solidarity and just transition declaration from Poland. So a major success for our just transition work. Thank you and give a big hand to the panel that uh, we, uh, made this morning very good. I will uh, very soon give the floor back to Joao, the president, uh, so we can start a debate in here. Uh, just uh, two uh, informations. Uh, first of them, I remind you that uh, uh, 1.15, when the buses start to leave from here, uh, 24 buses will take you over the be beautiful bridge. Some of you have also seen the television series, Bruen. That's actually the brew that you see in the television series. Uh, so uh, we need to, to have the passport with you. You don't need anything but a passport. And you will, of course, have dinner. We have sitting dinner together tonight, so we don't have to stand for the dinner. We have sitting dinner tonight. So uh, it will be calm and very Swedish and cultural, and etc. But you need your passport. Otherwise, we can't guarantee that you will come uh, over the bridge. Uh, and secondly, I've also asked to remind delegation leaders, the ones in, uh, in charge of the voting for your delegation, don't forget uh, it's open for more than an hour or more, the General Secretary election, but don't forget to go and cast your vote. Uh, thank you for this Just Transition discussion. I enter back to you, Joao. Vamos agora continuar com a lista de oradores. Nós vamos continuar com a lista de oradores. Ok? O próximo orador é Javier de Jesus Rojas, CTN Nicarágua. Não, não vai falar? Não hablar. Não está. Próximo orador, Ali Hamed Bikader, da GFWTU Iêmen. Yemen não está? Yemen não está. Kanakaru Nilapu CFTUI da Índia. Kanakaru da Índia não está também? Também não está. Edgar Morrica Vanegas, da CUTI Colômbia. Ok, Edgar. Quatro minutos. Um minutinho só, um minutinho, Edgar. Tá. É o seguinte, se, um minutinho, um minutinho, um minutinho. Se esses que foram chamados aqui são os delegados eleitos para as suas centrais sindicais para votarem, é, nós podemos chamar novamente, que parece que alguns não estão aqui porque estão votando. Ok? Então, Edgar, com a palavra. Bom dia, companheiras e companheiros. Um saludo da Central Unitária de Trabalhadores CUT Colômbia. 
Eh, hemos venido a este Congreso con la disposición de cambiar, de cambiar en todos los ámbitos y de respaldar las luchas que cada uno de los trabajadores adelantan en el mundo contra este sistema que genera exclusión y desigualdad. Por eso desde nuestra central acompañamos eh, y hoy respaldamos esa candidatura de Susana Camuso. Quiero contarles sobre la situación que la imposición de ese modelo económico del que se habló ayer aquí eh, implica en nuestro país porque ha sido una imposición de modelo a sangre y fuego. La situación de derechos humanos en Colombia es crítica. En los últimos tres años han sido asesinados en nuestro país 400 líderes sociales. En 2018, 21 dirigentes sindicales han sido asesinados en Colombia. Por eso seguimos trabajando desde nuestra central por la necesidad de conseguir la paz para nuestro país. Rechazamos que Colombia quiera ser constituido como el país para desestabilizar a nuestra América. Rechazamos cualquier injerencia que el gobierno colombiano quiera hacer en asuntos internos de otros países, como el caso de Venezuela. Creemos que los pueblos, de manera autodeterminada, deben definir y dirimir sus situaciones internas. Por eso, rechazamos que nuestro gobierno quiera eh, fomentar algún tipo de iniciativa contra cualquier país en nuestro continente. Creemos que la paz de Colombia debe ser vista como la posibilidad de paz de nuestra América. Por eso le solicitamos a este Congreso que el día de la aprobación de las resoluciones se apruebe una resolución que hemos presentado a la Comisión. Esa resolución, este Congreso debe condenar los asesinatos de los líderes sindicales en nuestro país. Debe solicitar al gobierno se cumplan los acuerdos pactados con las FARC y se avance con la mesa de diálogos con el Ejército de Liberación Nacional. Sin paz en nuestro país va a ser más difícil avanzar en una transición justa y va a ser más difícil avanzar en cambios que posibiliten derechos de libertad sindical y beneficios para los trabajadores y trabajadoras colombianas. Queremos invitarlos también en esa resolución para que los sindicatos europeos participen el próximo año, en el mes de enero, en Bruselas, en la Conferencia Europea por la Paz de Colombia. Creemos que va a ser un escenario importante para discutir no solo en qué situación está la paz de nuestro país, el papel de los trabajadores, sino en qué y cómo se están invirtiendo los recursos que varios de sus países han aportado para la consecución de la paz. Y queremos invitarles para que nos acompañen y ayuden a realizar el primer trimestre del próximo año en nuestro país el Foro por la Paz, los Derechos Humanos y los Derechos Laborales. Foro que haremos en el mes de abril en Colombia y que esperamos contar con la presencia de países como Túnez, Irlanda y otros países que han tenido experiencia de sus sindicatos y trabajadores en procesos de paz. Gracias y la lucha sigue. Obrigado, Edgar. Próximo orador, Estela Elvira Díaz, CTA Argentina. Buenos días, les traigo el saludo de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras de la Central de Trabajadores de la Argentina. Es un gusto estar en este congreso y plantear y discutir cuáles son los fundamentales debates que tiene la clase trabajadora a nivel mundial. En un mundo con un sistema imperante neoliberal que pone no solo en jaque los derechos elementales de trabajadores, trabajadoras y el pueblo, sino de nuestras democracias. 
Soy parte de un continente de la subregión del sur donde directamente, nuevamente, tenemos que discutir la defensa de la democracia. Porque hay golpes que, usando el sistema judicial, usando el poder mediático, encarcelan a los principales líderes y hackean la posibilidad de elecciones en libertad, como vimos que pasó en Brasil. Pero donde hay elecciones, nuestras democracias cada vez tienen menos intensidad menos derechos, peor institucionalidad. Y este es un fuerte debate que debe dar el movimiento sindical, porque hay que producir alternativas desde el movimiento sindical para cada uno de nuestros países, pero también para el mundo. Ese es el enorme desafío. El neoliberalismo no solo es mayor desigualdad, no solo confronta prácticamente con pensar sistemas democráticos de vida, también el neoliberalismo se alía para que crezca el racismo, la xenofobia, el sexismo, la misoginia. Este mundo es cada vez para menos, más difícil de, de convivir en él. Y aquí tenemos en debate una elección y el movimiento sindical tenemos el orgullo a las mujeres trabajadoras y lo tenemos que tener todos y todas, que la discusión de la Secretaría General es entre dos mujeres. Y nosotros como central apoyamos a Susana Camuso, pero entendemos que los debates por la justicia social son debates que hemos aprendido como movimiento sindical que son junto a la igualdad, a la no discriminación, a la inclusión en el conjunto de la diversidad que tiene nuestra clase trabajadora. Por eso quiero decir que reivindicamos la lucha del movimiento obrero y en Argentina estamos acá también junto con nuestros compañeros del sindicato de aeronáuticos. Dieron una fuerte pelea, el presidente de la nación los enfrentó, enfrentó y quiere tirar abajo, privatizar nuestra línea de bandera que tanto nos costó conseguir y recuperar. La lucha que permitió que se reconozca, que se vuelva a tomar a los trabajadores suspendidos y que se reabla la paritaria y se reconozca la deuda paritaria. En Francia la lucha paró el ajuste y paró el aumento de las tarifas. La lucha sirve, la lucha del pueblo trabajador, la lucha obrera sirve en alianza con los movimientos sociales, con el feminismo. Por eso quiero decir que es un gran desafío. Pensar otro mundo posible es un mundo antineoliberal, es un mundo que tiene que tener otro modelo y la clase trabajadora tiene un papel para jugar con fuerza en la construcción de ese modelo. Por último, libertad a los presos políticos. Libertad Milagro Sala. Queremos una Navidad sin presos políticos en la Argentina. Lula libre. Obrigado. Ahora, próximo orador, Rashid Malawi, do CG. ATA Algéria. Bonjour. Normalement, j'étais parmi les premiers listes de hier, de, de, le début de la séance, et je me trouve parmi les derniers. Et hier, à la fin de la liste, on était là. Et le matin, Je suis le dernier. Je voulais faire cette remarque parce que le premier jour, je voulais parler de Palestine et notre position pour la Palestine, qu'on est contre la modification, qu'on est pour le maintien de la déclaration du Congrès de 2014. Mais aussi, je voulais adresser au gouvernement, c'est-à-dire pour dire que le gouvernement israélien il n'est pas là seulement pour détruire les Palestiniens, mais il est aussi en train de soutenir toutes les dictatures. Et il est en train de détruire toutes les voies libres au monde arabe et au monde, en, 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 le monde en tout. Il est en train de soutenir le Sisi. 
le président égyptien qui est un dictateur et qu'ils il ont, ils ont assassiné le jeune chercheur italien. Il est en train de soutenir le prince saoudi qui a tué le journaliste et qui a aussi tué les, les, le peuple de Yémen. Il est en train aussi de soutenir le président brésilien ultralibéral, raciste, donc, contre Lula. Donc, le gouvernement israélien, il est en train de soutenir la dictature en Algérie. Et nous, en Algérie, on est, on est soumis à une dictature. Et en même temps, Sharon Deldibi, elle a parlé de la presse. On a dit journalistes en prison. Il y avait un qui a été tué avant le Saoudien. Et le deuxième qui devait mourir, heureusement, la campagne contre le prince Saoudi, elle a obligé le gouvernement algérien à libérer ce journaliste. Je voulais vous informer qu'on n'a pas un État en Algérie. On a un président malade qui ne bouge pas, qui ne parle pas. Depuis huit ans, on n'a pas entendu la voix du président. On est géré par des inconnus au pays. On est en danger. Et on voit d'autres syndicats avec nous qui sont là soutenir le cinquième mandat d'un président qui ne bouge pas, qui ne marche pas et qui ne mange pas. Donc je vous demande de, que le syndicat israélien fait combat contre ce gouvernement pour arrêter ce soutien aux dictatures. Et merci. Obrigado. Apenas um esclarecimento sobre a lista de oradores. Eu vou seguir sempre esta lista que organizada pela comissão de inscrição de oradores no Congresso. E eu quero informar ao plenário que eu só passei a ter essa lista quando eu insisti no microfone que eu precisava da lista completa. Então eu solicito à organização do Congresso que os novos oradores, isto é, aqueles que se inscreverem, serão acrescentados no final da lista e não no meio da lista. Então, estou pedindo à organização para que não intercalem mais. Aqueles que se inscreverem novos agora são acrescentados no final da lista, porque nós vamos seguir esta lista daqui para frente. Próximo orador é José Antônio Zepeda Lopes, FNT, Nicarágua. Gracias, Presidente. Bonjour, guten Morgen, good morning, buenos días. Son nuestros cuatro idiomas oficiales. Bom dia. Me toca hablar después de la pasarela, porque en algún momento se sintió eso en el ambiente, en el Congreso. Y obviamente es parte del ejercicio, de la práctica que hemos de realizar. Y me tocaba hablar sobre el primer tema, sobre la paz, democracia, pero creo que siempre es el momento. Hablar de la paz no es una ocasión, es permanente. Una paz con justicia, una paz con desarrollo, una paz de respeto, de respetar la autodeterminación de los pueblos, de las decisiones que toman los pueblos. Porque la injerencia de otros estados en las decisiones que toman nuestros pueblos conllevan a violentar esos procesos de transformaciones que hacemos. Y democracia siempre es bueno hablar Nunca es tarde ni nunca es temprano. La democracia es parte intrínseca del ser humano para poder opinar, para poder discernir, para poder plantear, para poder definir algunas decisiones. Y democracia es aprender a escucharnos. Aprendemos cuando nos escuchamos. Como educador he aprendido en la escuela. He aprendido con mis estudiantes que si sé escuchar, puedo enseñar, puedo educar. Pero cuando se tienen oídos sordos, 
solo se impone. Y se buscan las artimañas y los trucos para tener prevalencia en unos criterios. Nicaragua, un país pequeño en América Central, lastimosamente aparece en las noticias internacionales mayoría de falsedades, porque recién tuvimos el intento de un golpe de Estado financiado y orquestado por los que se creen ambos del mundo, donde nos asesinaron, nos mataron y 198 nicaragüenses murieron. Para querer cambiar el rumbo que tiene nuestro país de desarrollo, de democracia, de progreso. Por eso decimos las intervenciones que hacen los amos del mundo o que se consideran amos del mundo, solo llevan destrucción. Si no miremos cuántos países sobre la base de defender la democracia y de hablar de la paz provocaron la guerra y hoy esos pueblos son inmigrantes que son hoy culpados de la fuerza con que ellos destruyeron sus sociedades. Nicaragua ama la paz. Nicaragua construye la democracia. Nicaragua va construyendo con los trabajadores y con los que creen en el tripartismo, trabajando juntos y unidos. Sin embargo, nuestros adversarios, nuestros enemigos que nos han intervenido y muchas veces en nuestra historia, han querido nuevamente violentar eso. Por eso, compañeras y compañeras, Nicaragua insisten en buscar el diálogo, la paz, la armonía, la reconciliación y la unidad para seguir construyendo y salir de la pobreza a que nos han sometido las políticas neoliberales por muchos años y por aquellos que no intervinieron y que nos creen todavía traspatio de su territorio. ¡Viva la paz! ¡Viva la democracia! ¡Viva el amor! Gracias. Pregunta al plenario si Javier, Ali Hamed y Canacaro ya retornaron del proceso de votación. Bueno, avise-los cuando retornare para que venga aquí a la mesa, ahí la mesa dará la palabra. Continuando, entonces, el próximo orador es Saad Saban Mostafa, EDLC Egipto. Saad do Egipto. No está. Eh, ahora, el próximo orador, José Oveira Salinas, da UNT México. Buenos días, estimadas compañeras, estimados compañeros. Quiero dejar asentada una protesta. El día lunes me inscribí a las 8.15 de la mañana para poder participar en esta plenaria y en una primera lista era el primer orador de los compañeros de habla hispana. Finalmente me tocó hablar lo agradezco, pero la administración de esta lista es inadmisible. Hablo en nombre y en representación de la Unión Nacional de Trabajadores de México. Saludamos el mensaje político de los sindicatos daneses y suecos, así como de las autoridades gubernamentales. Ellos han asumido los retos del cambio y están construyendo importantes transformaciones sociales con una visión de largo plazo. Ustedes conocen que los mexicanos en el contexto del proceso electoral presidencial reciente votamos por el cambio de régimen político y por la democracia, porque estamos convencidos que los sindicatos debemos aportar una perspectiva de transformación política, económica y social desde la visión de los trabajadores. La actual coyuntura política internacional es una clara interpelación al movimiento sindical, pues pone en juego el futuro del sindicalismo en la disputa por una nueva gobernanza mundial y por la democracia. Recordando que en la declaración de principios de los estatutos de la CCI, en el párrafo quinto, esta se compromete a promover y actuar 
para la protección de la democracia en todo el mundo, por lo que las reglas deberán cambiarse en un contexto de democracia interna y auténtica. Es importante renovarnos y ser sujetos políticos del cambio, construir nuevas formas de articulación y convergencia de alternativas, no limitarnos únicamente a cambiar las reglas del juego. Debemos ir más allá y convertirnos en un sindicalismo de transformación social y superar una visión de ceder para defender los derechos conquistados. Nuestra labor es ampliarlos y reconstruir un nuevo internacionalismo con una mirada sociopolítica en la perspectiva de la emancipación de todas y todos. Bienvenido el debate, compañeras y compañeros, sobre el nuevo rumbo de la CCI. Debemos discutir acerca de los procedimientos y formas de las tomas de decisiones y transitar de un liderazgo cuasi unipersonal a formas de dirección colectiva, colegiadas y auténticamente democráticas e incluyentes. Es urgente introducir cambios en nuestros mecanismos de gobierno y de funcionamiento, siempre con los principios de la democracia, la transparencia y la participación efectiva de los sindicatos nacionales y voltear a ver todas las regiones, fortaleciendo su participación en los procesos de la toma de decisiones, sin dejar de reconocer la solidaridad de la CCI en nuestra lucha contra los contratos de protección patronal y el convenio 68, reconocemos este aporte de CCI, pero también en su momento nosotros cuestionamos algunas de las formas de la conducción política de nuestra compañera Sharon, pero lo hicimos directamente y personalmente a ella, una crítica constructiva. Y también lo hicimos en torno a la función del G20 y en torno a, un, a privilegiar una relación con la, el, el Ministerio del Trabajo de nuestro país. Por estas razones, damos la bienvenida a la postulación y el proyecto político de nuestra compañera Susana Camuso y transitar en unidad para profundizar la democracia interna en la cual todas las centrales sindicales y las regiones se expresen y sean tomadas en cuenta, desarrollando una dirección política colegiada plural, incluyente, capaz de construir los consensos requeridos para un relanzamiento y un fortalecimiento de la CCI. Finalizo con pleno respeto a la institucionalidad democrática y el respeto a nuestros estatutos, construyamos los consensos necesarios para un nuevo pacto social que recupere la centralidad del trabajo y la agenda social y laboral del sindicalismo. Fortalezcamos todos a la CCI y promovamos un relanzamiento para que el sindicalismo sea capaz de ser una opción de futuro para todas y todos. Por su atención, muchas gracias. Obrigado, José. Ahora, Sheik Diop, CNTS, do Senegal. Senegal, Shake, não está. Ou Nobila Cabore de Burkina Faso. Ou Nobila, o NSL de Burkina Faso. Burkina também não está. É, Mikhail Volinetes. KVPU da Ucrânia. Mikhail da Ucrânia. Добрый день. Я только проголосовал. Многие наши братья и сестры еще продолжают голосовать. Мне легко выступать с этой трибуны. Очень приятно, потому что я нахожусь в кругу друзей. Я очень давно являюсь членом профсоюза, профсоюзным активистом. Еще в 1989 году, когда существовал Советский Союз, я был шахтером, и тогда восстали больше одного миллиона шахтеров. И стало развиваться мощное рабочее движение. И тогда Шахтеры выдвигали своих активистов, 
и сами формировали независимые профсоюзы. Поэтому настолько приятно здесь общаться в кругу свободных людей, делегатов от рабочих, которым я был много лет назад. Хочу сказать, что с того времени Украина приобрела независимость. И поскольку это молодое государство, то мы столкнулись с многими проблемами. Не только построение государства, институции этого государства, а построение демократии, развитие гражданского общества. И постоянно мы сталкивались с вопросами соблюдения международных норм и стандартов. Мы учились, как нам работать и понимать, трактовать конвенции Международной организации труда. Мы постигали то, как работают механизмы защиты человека наемного труда, что такое Международная конфедерация свободных профсоюзов, которая потом трансформировалась в Международную конфедерацию профсоюзов. Мы владели этими механизмами, но мы столкнулись с другими вызовами. Война, которая сейчас постигла нашу страну. Соседняя страна, северная страна Россия, где мы жили в одной семье, как братья, где наши семьи разбросаны, вдруг проявила агрессию по отношению к Украине. Как в этой ситуации защищать рабочих? Как действовать независимым профсоюзом, когда на оккупированной территории и в аннексированном Крыму независимые профсоюзы были уничтожены одномоментно, а лидеры независимых профсоюзов постоянно преследовались и подвергались пыткам? В результате войны только на территории подконтрольной украинской власти приехало полтора миллиона беженцев. Для нашей страны это очень много. Они остались без работы, без дома. В один день они потеряли все. И разорваны интеграционные связи внутри страны, и с соседней Россией, и с многими странами. И санкции, которые применяются в связи с этим, они тоже бьют и по Украине. И мы столкнулись с новыми вызовами, когда низкая зарплата, когда она не вовремя выплачивается. Но мы, как профсоюзы, стремимся все-таки прилагать усилия, чтобы наше государство приобретало независимость, чтобы даже в военных условиях сохранить демократию, право на свободу ассоциации. И мы боремся за выплату зарплаты. Мы боремся, независимые профсоюзы. Кроме нас больше никто. Я вам при... вот такое фото покажу. Вот я, вот шахтеры, которые 32 дня просидели под землей и прекратили забастовку только 12 дней назад. Добивались выплаты зарплаты. И эти вопросы до конца еще не решены. Вот другой случай, когда один из лидеров независимого профсоюза во время проведения нами пресс-конференции вот я стою, вот этот лидер, он себя неожиданно поджег. Я заканчиваю. И вот результат этого поджога. Поэтому нам приходится сталкиваться с постоянными вызовами, проблемами. Но мы не сдаемся, потому что мы находимся в кругу нашей семьи, в семьи профсоюзных активистов и в кругу делегатов со всего мира. Спасибо вам за то, что вы есть. Спасибо за наше братство. Obrigado, Micael. É o Javier de Jesus Rojas, CTN Nicarágua, já retornou, então pode usar a palavra. Bom dia, presidente, bom dia, Lula Mesa, bom dia, companheiros e companheiras, trabalhadores do mundo. En nombre de la CTN y Nicaragua queremos darle un saludo especial a todo este Congreso. Pero también queremos pedirle a este Congreso que no aparte la mirada de Nicaragua. Somos los trabajadores y las trabajadoras que sufrimos cualquier situación difícil que pasa en nuestros países por las diferentes maneras políticas, sociales que se manejen en los países tanto de izquierda como de derecha. Y los que sufrimos esos impactos somos nosotros los trabajadores. Pedimos a ustedes su solidaridad para con nosotros y para que con nuestro pueblo de Nicaragua. 
ayer lo explicaba un compañero nuestro, de lo, la situación que estamos viviendo. Pero no es culpa de los trabajadores, no es culpa del Estado. Pero necesitamos que nos apoyen a resolver esta situación con el diálogo. Pedimos también a la CSI que si es cierto que vamos a cambiar y vamos a cambiar las normas con poder, hay que enseñarle la democracia a los jóvenes que están aquí presentes. Y desde aquí tenemos que enseñarle que tenemos que cambiar, dándole el espacio al que corresponde y que el que va a trabajar. Gracias por este momento y que Dios los bendiga a todos. Obrigado, Javier. Próximo orador, Adam Rogalewski, OPZZ, Polonia. Uh, dear colleagues, dear comrades, Sharon, uh, I'm really pleased to speak here uh, from my country, Poland, but also as a, a former member of the ETUC Youth Committee. And I'm really disappointed that at this Congress we didn't reach our aim to have 15% of young delegates. Can I see young delegates here? Can they stand up? Can you stand up, please? Can you wave? Because you are the future of world trade unionism, and we really need to invest in you. Dear colleagues, I will be speaking about the second pillar, uh, regulating economic power. Poland, one was, Poland was one of the countries which was mostly affected by the low wages and unscrupulous multinational companies. Since the collapse of the communist regime in 1989, our real wages deteriorated, state-owned companies had been brutally privatized and sold for low price to multinational companies. The same multinational companies operated in special economic zones with lower or no taxes. After the Poland accession to the European Union and opening the Western European labor market for Polish citizens, many of Polish workers who had no hope to find a job in Poland, or their job was very low paid, have to uh, leave Poland and move to Western Europe. As a result, we lost many qualified workforce, workforce which in many instances was educated for free in Poland. I belong also to this group and was forced to leave Poland. Therefore, we very much welcome the statement of the ITUC, ITUC particularly with relation to pillar number two, regulating economic power. Dear colleagues, my country is the best example of neoliberal policies which attacks workers' rights and trade unions. Due to our membership in the European Union, we were able to economic, economically grow and Poland become a country of migration. This, however, resulted in a situation that Polish companies rely, and Polish multinational companies, rely strongly on migrant workers coming from other parts of the world. And those multinational companies are exploiting migrant workers coming to, coming to Poland. We have to stop. We have to stop the corporate grid and together globally fight for better working conditions. Secondly, we support the Congress statement on just transition, particularly that we have the only one planet. This week, the conference on climate change is taking place in my home country in Katowice. For us, it is a very difficult decision to support decarbonization and because many of our local communities rely on work in coal mines and heavy industry. It is also very difficult for us to support decarbonization because our largest well-organized trade unions are in, all, in coal on or energy sector. However, we have the only one planet and we need to put our future first. Therefore, we support the Paris Agreement and actions uh, to uh, stop global working. Of course, within the framework of just transitions because the work workers and our trade unions are first. Finally, in Poland this year, we celebrate 100th anniversary of regaining independence after uh, foreign occupation. And we used to say in Poland, we fight for our and your freedom. And I think we should change this statement to say it, we fight for our and yours better working conditions and better world for working people and for global solidarity. Thank you very much. Obrigado. Agora, Enan Mayara, 
Enam Mayara, e depois o companheiro do Iêmen, Ali Hamed, já pode vir aqui na frente, que ele já retornou do processo de votação e fará uso da palavra após o Enam. Pode. Shukran, Sid Raiz, Sid Alamin Al-Amma, Akhwati Ikhwani, Al-Nakabiyat, Al-Nakabiyin, Abra Al-Alam. Tahiyya Min Al-Maghrib, Wa Min Al-Harak Al-Nakabiyya Al-Maghribiyya, التي تعتبر ضمن أكبر الحركات النقابية في إفريقيا وتعتبر كذلك من ضمن المناضلين والمناضلات المكافحين معكم جميعا حول حقوق العمال والعاملات نهني أنفسنا ونهني الأخوات والإخوة من نقابات الدنمارك على هذا التنظيم الجيد أولا كما أهني الأخت الأمينة العامة شارون على ما أسدته لهذه المنظمة من أعمال جليلة تلخصت أساسا بالنسبة لنا في المغرب من مساندة حقيقية لنضالاتنا النقابية نضالاتنا التي كانت أساس قوتنا وأساس اتحادنا نحن هنا في مؤتمر نريد أن نقوي الحركة العمالية ولا يمكن تقوية الحركة العمالية بدون تضامن عمالي حقيقي عالمي عابر للقارات كما أن هناك شركة عابرة للقارات يجب أن يكون هناك عمل نقابي حقيقي عابر للقارات قادر على أنه ينتزع حقوق طبع العمالية أينما كانت وتحت أي ظروف كانت سواء سياسية أو اقتصادية أو اجتماعية نحن هنا اليوم من أجل تعزيز العمل النقابي ولسنا اليوم من أجل تفرقة الصف النقابي وأعتقد على أن تعزيز العمل النقابي ينطلق أساسا من مبدأين أساسيين هو مبدأ التضامن والذي نعتبره أساسيا والمبدأ الثاني هو مبدأ التصور الجماعي للعمل النقابي في ظل تطورات سوق الشغل أولا وفي ظل أيضا تطورات جديدة تشهدها الساحة السياسية من صعود القوى اليمينية أولا وكذلك من صعود الشركات المتعددة الجنسية والتي تضرب العمل النقابي في عمقه أعتقد على أننا اليوم أمام امتحان عسير هذا الامتحان الذي يجب أن ننجح فيه جميعا ولا يمكن أن ينجح فينا أحد بوحده أو دون الآخرين ولذلك فإن تضامن اليوم مع العمال في فلسطين هو تضامن من أجل الإنسانية والكرامة تضامن مع لولا المسجون هو تضامن عمالي عمالي وليس في نطاق سياسي تضامن مع المهضومة حقوقهم في اليمن في أي جزء من هذا العالم المظلومين الذين يعيشون تحت وطأة الإمبريالية وتحت وطأة أيضا من لا يرحمون أعتقد أننا اليوم في زمن جديد وفي فرصة جديدة تفتح للاتحاد الدولي للنقابات من أجل تعزيز الصف شكرا لكم وشكرا لهذا التنظيم الرائع ودمتم أوفياء للنضال والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Obrigado Renan Agora eu chamo o Ali Hamed do Iêmen que estava votando por isso que eu passei na frente Assid al-Rais Assidat al-Sada Bidaitan isuadni ana kuna bainakum في المؤتمر الرابع للاتحاد الدولي للنقابات الذي يعقد في كوبنهاجن هذه المدينة الرائعة متمنيا النجاح والتوفيق للمؤتمر الذي يعقد في ظل تحديات كبيرة تواجهها المنظمات العمالية وإننا نشعر بالفخر أن نكون من ضمن أسرة الاتحاد الدولي للنقابات هذه المنظمة الدولية التي تعمل وتبذل الجهود من أجل تحقيق العدالة الاجتماعية وتعزيز الحوار الاجتماعي ليكون السبيل في الحياة الكريمة لعمال العالم ويسعدني أن أتقدم بجزيل الشكر للسيدة شارون على كل الذي بدلتها مع الاتحاد العام النقابات عمال اليمن ومع اليمن أثناء ما كانت تعرض اليمن لهجمات شرسة وحرب طروس شنتها دول كثيرة من العالم وكانت تتضمن علينا وعلى عمالنا الذي كانوا يحرقون في المصانع وفي مواقع العمل من هذا القصف الذي طال كل حياتنا وانتزع مننا حقوقنا الكثيرة التي نعمل أن تكون نهايتها قريبة إن شاء الله السيادات السادة جميعنا ندرك وأنتم تدركون من خلال متابعاتكم للأحداث التي يمر بها اليمن والذي يعاني من حرب عبثية وظالمة تدار منذ أكثر من أربعة عوام 
كانت سبب في معاناة أكثر من 25 مليون إنسان وبحسب تقارير المنظمات الإنسانية والحقوقية فأنها تمر بأسوأ كارثة إنسانية في العصر الراهن تم تدمير البناء التحتية والخدمية وانهيار القطاع الصحي والتعليمي وفقدان الوظائف وانهيار العملة المحلية وارتفاع الأسعار وزيادة الفقر والبطالة وانتشار الأمراض وتوقف رواتب وقتل الأطفال والنساء والشيوخ وفي وضع كهذا فإن الاتحاد العام نقابة عمال اليمن ومنذ الوهلة الأولى قد طالب عبر كل الوسائل المتاحة إلى أنهاء الحرب وبصورة عاجلة ولكن للأسف لم تلاقي تلك الدعوات السبيل إلى التحقيق واليوم فإننا نكرر دعوتنا لأحلال السلام العادل والشامل ومحاسبة ومحاكمة كل الذين ارتكبوا الجرائم في حق الإنسانية في اليمن وتقديمهم للعدالة حتى ينال كل الضحايا حقهم في عدالة إنسانية عالمية فلنجعل من العام القادم عاما للسلام العادل في اليمن وفلسطين وسوريا والعراق وليبيا وفي كل دول العالم التي تعاني من الصراعات والنزاعات والحروب فأنني أكرر التهاني لكم جميعا وأتمنى للمؤتمر النجاح وأؤكد لكم أننا في الاتحاد العام نقابة عمال اليمن نخوض نضالا برغم الظروف الصعبة التي نمر بها وقد كانت لنا لقاءات متعددة توجت هذه اللقاءات بصرف رواتب المتقاعدين التي وقفت منذ فترة طويلة ونعمل مع الحكومة في صرف رواتب الموظفين الآخرين والذي يقدرون بأكثر من مليون ومئتين عامل كما أن أكثر من أربعة مليون عامل فقدوا أعمالهم ووظائفهم ولا زلنا نعمل من أجل صرف رواتب الموظفين المتوقفة واليوم أننا بحاجة إلى دعمكم مع حكوماتكم في بلدانكم لأنهاء الحرف في اليمن وفي هذا الشهر تقام محادثات السلام في السويد الشقيق نتمنى الدعم لها من كلكم من أجل نصل إلى حلول عادلة وإنهاء هذه الحرب كما نؤكد دعمنا لكل النضالات العمال في العالم ودعمنا لأخواننا في فلسطين لا حدود له فمن حقهم أن تكون لهم دولة مستقلة وذات سيادة وعاصمة هالقد الشريف وفقكم الله ورعاكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Obrigado, Ali. Eu chamo agora o Paul Nobila, de Burkina, que parece que já retornou do processo de votação. Paul Nobila. Está aqui. Camarade, bonjour. Tout d'abord, je remercie le camarade Charol, que j'aime bien et que je le soutiens toujours. Déclaration des organisations syndicales de Burkina Faso, de la Guinée, du Mali, du Niger, sur le terrorisme et la violation des droits syndicaux. Camarades, au nom des organisations syndicales si dessus citées, nous saluons la tenue du président Congrès sur le thème « Renforcer le pouvoir des travailleurs, changer les règles ». Nous saluons aussi l'idée de vote du plus mauvais patron pour laquelle nous avons souscrit. Mais, nous concernant spécifiquement, notre intervention pourra sur le pire fléau de notre temps que l'imaginaire humain ait créé, à savoir le terrorisme. Camarades, ce fléau qui nous est imposé pour des raisons que nous avons des difficultés à identifier, nous a déjà coupé, coûté des milliers de vies de nos compatriotes, dont de certains travailleurs détruits autant d'emplois et de précariser nos économies déjà fragiles. L'éducation nationale et la santé publique ne s'exercent plus dans certaines parties de nos nations. Les travailleurs et surtout les représentants des syndicaux sont obligés de quitter ces zones où leurs vies sont menacées. Camarades, le terrorisme a objectif de remettre en cause la démocratie et de ce fait les libertés dans nos pays pour lesquels nos organisations ont participé à conquérir à coup de sacrifice. Il est là la négation de toutes les valeurs que nous défendons. Pour ce faire, nous nous, nous, nous appelons à une solidarité agissante 
pour les pays soumis au terrorisme. Nous dénonçons, nous devons démontrer par les, par les, par les États de tous les gouvernements qui, d'une manière ou d'une autre, soutiennent le terrorisme. Il n'y a pas pour nous de bons ou de mauvais terroristes, ils sont tous mauvais et criminels. Nous rappelons ainsi que les armes qui nous terrorisent et nous tuent ne sont pas de fabrication africaine. Nous pouvons et nous devons agir, car le terrorisme n'a pas de frontières. Il ne connaît ni de nationalité, ni de statut social. Enfin, en plus du terrorisme de certains de nos États, notamment le cas de la Guinée, où tous les droits syndicaux sont bafoués, emprisonnement, licenciement abusif des leaders syndicaux, le non-respect de tous les protocoles d'accord tripartite et le manque de dialogue social. Pour tous ces mots qui assaillent les travailleurs de, tout, de nos nations, nous vous demandons encore votre soutien inlassable pour la dénonciation de ces actes qui remettent en cause le mouvement de nos nations, les acquis et le pouvoir des travailleurs à améliorer continuellement les conditions de vie, de travailleurs et, et même d'existence. Vive la CECI, vive le camarade Charol. Agora, mais uma oradora, e depois passaremos a palavra à companheira Sharon. Rosa Helena Fleres Gonzalez, CTC Colômbia. Rosa, da CTC Colômbia. Está lá. Muy buenos días para todos, todas. Un saludo fraterno a la mesa. Gracias, señor presidente. A nombre de la Confederación de Trabajadores de Colombia, CTC, un saludo fraterno a este cuarto congreso de nuestra Confederación Sindical Internacional, CCI. Quisiera aprovechar estos minutos para agradecerles al movimiento sindical, a la CCI en general, a la CCA, por el apoyo solidario constante durante estos años de, que ha tenido Colombia en el proceso de paz, en construir una paz. Es de gran preocupación lo que está sucediendo hoy. Le hemos apostado a este proceso porque creemos que desarrollo para un país, el fundamento principal es tener paz. Y nuestra preocupación radica es en, en el sentido de que hoy los trabajadores, el pueblo de Colombia, el movimiento sindical no tiene garantías para ejercer libremente el ejercicio que es la esencia, la vida del movimiento sindical, la libertad sindical. Hoy en día existe, ha, han habido asesinatos de líderes sindicales, de líderes defensores de los derechos humanos. Existe la violación al derecho fundamental de la libertad sindical. Existe negación a tener una negociación colectiva. Existe la negación que un trabajador o trabajadora se afilie a un sindicato. Y eso son, esa es la política antisindical que no solamente tiene el gobierno nacional, 
sino que también ha implementado muchas multinacionales que llegan a Colombia, donde se le niega el derecho a afiliarse a un trabajador o trabajadora, a un sindicato. Por eso cuando hablamos de cambiar reglas, que es, debería ser un borrón y cuenta nueva. Porque cambiar las reglas significa cambiar el sistema económico. Un sistema que tiene muchos tentáculos, que atacan por cualquier lado al pueblo, que ataca a los trabajadores, que ataca a las mujeres, que nos está consumiendo. Por eso, cuando llegamos a este Congreso, venimos con muchas esperanzas, con muchas expectativas de salir fortalecidos, de llevar un, 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 una declaración que abarque al mundo del trabajo. Muchísimos hombres, mujeres, jóvenes están esperando que los que estamos aquí hoy reunidos realmente lleguemos a nuestro país fortalecido con un accionar del movimiento sindical donde tengamos realmente un desarrollo. No se nos puede negar el derecho que tiene un ser humano, no se nos puede negar el derecho que tiene un trabajador. Quisiera también decirles, y finalizando con esto, que el pueblo de Colombia necesita hoy la solidaridad, porque no, el proceso de paz está muy débil en este momento. Necesitamos que nos sigan apoyando, que nos siga apoyando también a las organizaciones sindicales. Muchas gracias. Antes de pasar para a compañera Sharon, eu solicitaria que, se alguma organização sindical ainda não votou, que a sala lá de votação está bastante livre. Portanto, quem ainda não votou, por favor, se dirija à sala de votação. Companheira Sharon. Thank you, Shual, and I'll be quick because people have to uh, get those uh, buses to uh, Malmo. We don't want to miss out on a fantastic afternoon. So uh, let me say there are only three amendments, and just to clarify the process, these are giving you an indication of our advice to the Standing Orders Committee, but they will decide on the final document that comes back to the Congress for debate, if necessary, on Friday. The, uh, there are three amendments, as I said. One's from Ella Spain. Ella, we accept absolutely the 1.5 degrees, and I think we've already uh, said that with a previous amendment. We should take heed of the UN, uh, 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 sorry, the IPCC report that frankly showed us that hot house earth is a reality if we don't try to achieve that. In terms of uh, the issue about the treaty being binding and just transition, I would ask you that we don't concede that. That'll be the stuff of lawyers if we decide to test it in the, uh, in the courts. So let's not concede it in a public resolution of ours, uh, although I do accept that making it binding is very difficult. In terms of uh, adding uh, the creation of green jobs to just transition, absolutely. Um, and uh, from uh, uh, STTK, then let me tell you that uh, we can absolutely accept uh, the uh, amendments around opportunities uh, for just transitions. But can I also ask your indulgence to make sure it aligns with the text, because there's several uh, amendments around that. We can't deny the uh, horror of the impact on uh, working families, but we can absolutely try to make transitions just, just and indeed create jobs. And finally, FNV have added a, uh, a range of uh, issues around quality teaching and tools for learning. There's already another amendment in that, that amended this, so I accept it. The other was in line, and I ask you to be tolerant of the, S the Standing Orders Committee actually blending it to get everybody's voice. So, only three amendments today, but can I just say thank you. This is a very important part 
indeed of our work around uh, the future of work, the threats of climate and the opportunities that we can create from investment and just transitions and, of course, uh, the, uh, the struggle to make sure that refugees are included as part of our understanding of what requires just transition. Don't forget to come to Malmo. It's going to be a great afternoon. It will show us the most diverse city in the world. And if they can make it work, reinvent the city, integrate all those wonderful nationalities from around the world and make them Swedish as well as their uh, nation of origin, then we can do it in the rest of the world. It's a real tribute to the Swedish uh, um, trade unions, but equally, it's a model for the world. Let's go see it. Thank you. Obrigado, Sharon. Passaria a palavra agora para o companheiro Peter, que dará as orientações sobre a viagem à Suécia. Ok, thank you very much. Uh, we are now about 40 minutes before the buses start to leave, and as I said earlier on, there are 24 buses, so uh, please uh, come there, arrive there about quarter past one. It will continue to go one by one and try to find your, uh, a language uh, where you can understand so you can be informed in the bus in the, in the tour of Malmö before reaching the conf conference center. So uh, the buses start to leave in 45 minutes. Uh, and again, for the third time, don't forget to bring your passport because otherwise we can have a big problem at the border. So bring your passport, see you quarter past one, be fantastic in Malmö. I will uh, teach you some Swedish songs as well. I'd like to salute the Fourth World Congress of the ITUC as you celebrate 150 years of courage and activism in pursuit of peace, of democracy, of rights and of social justice. We are living in a very difficult time where we have 